Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. Things are about to go nuclear, so make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below and let's get into it. Our first story of the day is by Team Smeek. Treat me like a maid and threaten me? I'll just make you homeless. This isn't a fake story, I promise you, but this dragged over a number of months. Cast for this will be me, the one that should have known better, boyfriend, my lovable hero, F, old flatmate who's the spawn of Satan, FB, the spawn of Satan's play toy landlord, isn't it obvious? So I've known F for a number of years and we had a good friendship up until a year ago. I was a hormonal young woman that wanted to have her own space and F felt the same. So we put our money together and rented a flat. But when I say our money, I mean 70% mine and 30% hers. I didn't have a problem with it at first because I was just glad to not have my mom in my ear 24-7. I even paid for all the furniture in the flat just for everything to be broken, ripped, or messed up with food and cigarette butts. That comes later. I had boyfriends stay with me in my room and it was amazing. And flatmate had flatmate's boyfriend stay with her. Now, boyfriend and I live in our own flat in a different city because crap hit the fan in more ways than one. Now I don't have a friend, but I'm better off that way because that was no friend. In the beginning, me and flatmate, friend, opened a joint account for bills and kept our separate accounts, so bills didn't fall on one person, which I come to find a few months later that when I got paid, end of the month, flatmate took the money from the account until their payday which was on a set date every month. This led to unpaid bills and calls coming through to me from companies chasing for money. When I confronted Flatmate about it, they said they needed to travel, but I knew it was going to drugs for Flatmate and their boyfriend. They did some weird stuff. I know I should have known better and nipped it in the bud there and then, but no. Flatmate even begged me for money after taking money out of the account every month, and me being me, lent it to her. Flatmate paid nothing towards food shopping, but Flatman and their boyfriend ate every last thing. If money wasn't an issue, cleanliness was. Plates, cups, and pots left all over the kitchen, and I was mismade expected to clean everything, which I did because I have OCD and can't stand mess. If you saw it, you'd understand. When I finally put my foot down, Flatmate told me that my boyfriend left plates on the side too. Boyfriend laughed and told flatmate that his plates were on the side overnight. Hers were there for six days. Flatmate still took the piss and never cleaned up unless I said anything, like I was her mother. After that, flatmate's boyfriend waited until my boyfriend left the flat to go to the shop and shouted at me, telling me to sort myself out before he does, blah blah blah, empty threats. Flatmate's boyfriend didn't realize I was on the phone to boyfriend and boyfriend came back to the flat. Before he got through the door, flatmate's boyfriend ran out, slamming my door and calling me a witch while running away like a wussy because he's scared of boyfriend. That's actually true, but it's too long to add. Bear in mind, boyfriend's like the big friendly giant. One day, flatmate and their boyfriend went away without a word and flatmate had taken things from my room my hair straightener, my jumper, and my brush. So I went into their room to retrieve them. The smell that hit my nose when I opened the door made me so angry, I don't know why, but immediately I got on the phone with the landlord. This is the revenge part. The landlord came over the next day while friend and their boyfriend were still out and saw the state that flatmate left the flat in. He was so livid he swore and apologized to me. He was sweet but said he wanted to issue her a notice to leave the flat and gave me permission to stay. Although I was thankful of his generous offer, I didn't want to stay where I felt such bad energy. Before he issued the notice, I called boyfriend and asked him to arrange a removal van while I contact a storage company to rent a locker. I then dismantled and packed the furniture from the kitchen, bathroom, and living room, packed up the van, and kept my things safe. God knows flatmate would have stolen them. When flatmate and their boyfriend got back, flatmate saw the notice and furniture gone. She got so mad she stormed out. The notice had mentioned that the cleanliness of the flat was disgusting. The loud music had been reported by neighbors. They had a boombox playing at anti-social hours. And smoking in the flat was not allowed, which flatmate knew before signing the agreement. Flatmate never spoke a word to me after the notice was served and left the flat before the two months was up. The idiots left her bedroom windows open and tried to sneak in later that evening, but
but I shut them and made sure they were locked with the key. The door key was changed by the landlord immediately after flatmate and their boyfriend left. Me and my boyfriend stayed about a month later to make sure the flat was presentable to the new tenants before we moved on. We now live in a much nicer area and are trying for our first baby. Wish us luck. Oh, also, flatmate and their boyfriend broke up. I heard through the grapevine. Flatmate burned every last bridge with her family and even called my boyfriend for money. Thankfully, he didn't help her. We haven't heard a word from her since, and I couldn't be happier to be rid of that leech. Sorry if it seems so all over the place. Like I said, this happened about a year ago, and I've tried to forget the little details so I can move on with my life. But unfortunately, this really happened. If you don't believe me, that's up to you. So, if you had this go down, and it basically came out that you set in motion the chain of events that got them evicted, and they're the kind of people that were resorting to begging for money for drugs, would you try and move out and find a new place that they don't know about ASAP? Or with some good locks on the door, maybe some cameras, wouldn't bother you too much? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Can You Change Usernames? Paintballs. Not in my story, but an old trucker who doesn't have Reddit. We got stuck at sea on a rescue boat yesterday and passed the time sharing pro revenge stories, so, as told by him, I was a fuel trucker. Say that five times fast. I had a regular daily route in my state and would start just after 4 p.m., so I was refilling the area's gas stations roughly after evening rush. This had me driving late into the night. In this one small town, it seemed like every night around 10, this jerk in a T-top would pass me on the road while pleasuring themselves. He always seemed to find me, pull up next to me on the highway, and try to get my attention before zipping off down the road. One week, I saw him three nights in a row at the same red light. It was the summer, so he had his roof down each time. Then I got an idea, a wonderful idea. When I got home, I gathered what I needed for my teenaged son's room and slept better than I had in weeks. The next night, as I drove through that small, rural, deep south town, sure enough, Mr. T-Top pulled up next to me and whacking it and giggling as he looked up at me, noticing that my window was down for the first time. Then he saw the paintball gun. My son was avid at the sport and had saved for a long time to buy this thing and modify it out for team and league stuff. My point is, it could shoot very, very fast. And I lit him up. The inside of his car, him and his, ahem, <clears throat> lap, were covered in green paint in about three seconds. I don't know how long it took him to get in gear and run that red light, but I was empty before he was out of the intersection. This is one of those situations that's so perfect because, despite OP doing that, they literally cannot report them to the police unless they want to get in trouble themselves. It would literally be a situation of, "Uh uh-huh, and so why do you have paint in that location? Like, they would have to somehow get through explaining that, that they were committing a very blatant case of public indecency. So run off home and hope you can get that green paint out of everywhere, car and person. This next story is by Alaska Guy, INDK, Teens threw eggs at our neighbor's houses, dented and broke a window on their truck. So in our neighborhood for years, teens would egg houses around October. It caused problems since in Alaska it would be around freezing at that time and eggs would freeze to the house and wouldn't be able to be removed until spring. One year, me and my half-brother had gotten some paintball guns. They were awesome for little wars and playing around and having capture the flag matches. Well, some friends called our house a few days before Easter and said they just got egged. So me and my brother talked and decided to climb onto the garage roof with paintball guns and wait for the eggers. After about an hour or two of waiting on the roof in the freezing cold, negative 10, maybe negative 15 Fahrenheit, they finally pull up in front of our house. It's a nice Ford F-150 or something like that, think cool kids truck. Three to five people in the bed of the truck start throwing eggs at our house. Me and my brother let loose. The sounds of paintballs pinging off metal and flesh was awesome. The ow, oh freak, ah, that came from the eggers was better. The back window breaking on the truck scared us though, so we hopped off the roof and hid the paintball guns. While breaking them down, we realized the paintballs had frozen in the cold, so that's why the window broke, in case the cops came. They never did. Nobody egged our neighborhood that I know of since. 
This is yet again another situation where they literally can't like report this to the police without that blatant precursor of, yeah, we were egging the person's house. Like they probably very legitimately could get OP in trouble, maybe even for some serious charges considering those paintballs froze over, but they'd have to be willing to get in trouble a little bit themselves too. And our final story of the day is by the foot 58. Manager thought my job role was unnecessary, finds out the hard way it wasn't. About 20 years ago, I was a sales engineer supporting sales reps at D-Bag Tech Company. A new sales manager joins the team. He was a former co-worker from a prior job, a petty little man. Prior, we were peers. Now, he was a manager over the sales reps I supported. I had a separate chain of command. He wasn't my manager, but he felt like he should be. He was resentful of the power that sales engineers in this new company had. In an attempt to show me up, he closed a very large deal with a banking company and did so without any involvement from the sales engineers, just one sales rep. He gloats about it publicly, talks about how we don't even need sales engineers, the whole nine yards. Later, the manager calls me in a panic and we talk with the customer. The sales rep and the rep sales manager totally messed things up and sold the customer an incompatible set of solutions. I say that the customer could exchange one bit of stuff for another bit of stuff, everything would work, and they're roughly the same price so nobody would lose any money, but the sales manager doesn't want to do it because admitting he messed things up would make him look bad. And he witches at me for bringing up price because that's supposed to be the rep's job. He calls my boss and poops all over me. My boss took his side and poops all over me too. So I'm like, freak you, I quit. I sent a very lengthy, detailed letter to HR explaining how the sales rep messed up, lied to the customer, and how the sales manager and my boss tried to make me the scapegoat instead of trying to fix it, which would have been easy and made everyone happy. I move on, get a new job, do other things. At some point, I'm chatting with an old friend from DTC and he mentions they messed up on a huge deal that they spent a year on. I'm still bitter about the D-bag sales rep manager and my jerk boss, so I post about it on a forum a bunch of investors use. The stock crashed $13 the next day. This will be important later. I find out ABC is suing DTC for freaking up the deal. The deal that the D-bag sales rep manager messed up and tried to pin on me. I reach out to ABC send them a copy of the letter I sent to HR, in which I detailed precisely how badly DTC messed them over. I talk with one of their lawyers and he's very happy, especially the part of my letter where I describe how the sales rep lied to ABC. DTC subpoenas me for a deposition. I have to tell DTC's lawyers everything that I told ABC's lawyers. Lawyer stuff. The day before the deposition, DTC sues me directly. Remember DTC's stock crashing? They're suing me for bad-mouthing the company and attempting to short their stock, which I wasn't. However, there's a twist. Because DTC is suing me directly, I don't have to say crap to them at the deposition. Their preparation for the lawsuit goes completely out the window. They know they're freaked because they read the letter I sent HR but they don't know how freaked because they don't know what else I know or what I've told ABC's lawyers. Additionally, because they never deposed me, they can't catch me contradicting myself between what I say at the deposition and at trial. They're dumbfounded. No idea how they could have messed up this badly. Turns out there were two legal teams, one defending against ABC's lawsuit and another trying to scare people away from talking crap about the company on the internet by indiscriminately suing their critics. They don't communicate with each other, and the one team didn't mention to the other team that they would be suing a key witness in their case. DTC settles the lawsuit with ABC, and they drop the lawsuit against me. And they fire the sales rep, the sales rep manager, and his manager too. Well, it sure was a costly and time-wasting experience, but they finally made the moves that they should have done to begin with which is just get rid of all of those cancerous people. Guess they had to go through several extremely painful bouts to realize that though. Teacher bullies my dad, bullies my bro, gets nuked. 
The town where this happened is a small one, and the school that I went to is a 70-year-old school. My granddad and my dad are also alumni of this school. Let me just start off by saying this, that the alumni of this school are really successful. And the school has had a long history of being very charitable and also offering amazing retirement benefits to teachers depending on how long they've worked there. My great granddad donated some of his property to the school when it was being constructed and he was an advisor and a part of the school board in his time. The school was an all boys school up until 1996 when they had their first co-ed class and is a full co-ed now. The school also has all classes from kindergarten to high school split in two buildings the first one houses kindergarten to 5th grade, and the other has classrooms from 6th to 12th grade. Part 1, Teacher vs. Dad, The Incident Said teacher, we're gonna call her MD, was my dad's math teacher when he started high school. She was a young woman just finishing her teaching degree, and was a master's in math and chemistry. At that point, she was the most qualified teacher the school had. Unfortunately, MD was also a nasty person. She walked into class and the students were expected to be sitting in ready mode, back straight, legs together, hands on the laps, with only the needed textbook and a pencil to take notes on the margins. The class was expected to greet her with a good morning or afternoon when she walked in, and she assigned tons of weekend homework. She would simply stop teaching for the entire hour-long class if one person spoke without having asked to speak. You couldn't drink water without her permission, couldn't go to the restroom unless she finally saw your raised hand and asked you to speak. There were multiple cases of people complaining against that, but with her being the most qualified teacher there, the school board didn't take action. Instead, they supported her by saying that this would help discipline the students. But this isn't even the beginning of it. Her exams were incredibly hard, and with the classes being full of teenage boys, they would talk and even one of them doing so would cause her to stop teaching and not teach until the next class. She would then lecture on a different topic, completely skipping that part of chemistry. Suffice to say, before the finals, the entire class was in a panicked state, trying to self-study enough to at least pass the class. My dad ended up getting a 41%. Our education system said you failed the class if you had under 40%, so he was relieved that he passed. But when he went through his answer sheet, my dad noticed that his totaling was incorrect and that he in fact had a 49 on the test. He raised his hand, and after about 5 minutes or so of him just sitting in his seat calmly with his hand raised, he was called on and MD asked what the problem was. Dad told her that there was a totaling mistake in the final and that he actually had a 49. This somehow offended her. Instead of calling him forth and checking his paper, MD decided that it was simply impossible for her, a master's in math, to make a mistake in something as simple as addition. She waved him off, and my dad was shocked, but she calmly turned to the next person with a question. My dad, on the other hand, was not happy. He walked up from his seat, which was basically considered a crime in her class, and put the paper on MD's desk, and started totaling his points loudly. MD incredulously watched him do that and was at a loss for words. Though when he was done totaling, you could see her face was flushed and she was furious. She looked furiously from the paper to my dad and then back to the paper. And then suddenly, a cruel smile appeared on her face. She says, oh okay, I see the mistake, but that's no excuse for this behavior. This awards a subtraction of 10 points from your final. The class that was amazed at the first sentence went back to having grim looks. And my dad stood there, jaw dropped, that he now had 39 points and had failed this class. Instead of responding and making the situation worse, he simply took his final, packed his backpack, and left the classroom. He went and spoke to his granddad who was on the school board, but he said he couldn't do anything since grades were completely in the hands of the teacher concerned. My dad took his loss and decided that revenge was not worth the trouble and switched classes. He dropped chem and took up econ and that was the last interaction he ever had with this teacher. Part 2, Teacher versus My Brother and I My younger brother, B, is two years younger to me, and so when I was in freshman year, starting high school, my younger brother was in 7th grade. We had an auditorium under construction, and the library was newly renovated, so a teacher was assigned to chaperone the younger class students at the library. My younger brother's class unfortunately had MD as their chaperone, 
My dad had specifically instructed me to be very careful around MD, and I was on the lookout, but my younger brother had no idea just who he was dealing with. Before summer, our library allows students to take any two books of their choice for the break. So, when my brother walked past MD to the librarian and was stopped by MD, he was really confused. He had an Eden Blyton book and a copy of Backyard Science Experiments. Both my younger brother and I are really good at science-related topics, and he'd been waiting for summer break to do some cool science experiments at home with me. MD said, wait a minute, what book do you have there, B? B said, a storybook and a backyard science book, ma'am. MD said, what are you going to do with that backyard science book? Turning to the other library staff, I taught his father, no brains in there. You would have no idea what to do with this book, leave it for someone who does. And with that, she snatched the book from his hands and walked away, the library staff giving awkward laughs behind her. When he came looking for me, crying, I was furious. I was a really popular guy at school. I won quizzes and debates and represented the school in national competitions. My friends and I literally had an entire showcase of trophies at school with our names embossed on it and most teachers loved us. Man, the vice principal of the school and our group were on first name basis. He chaperoned us on all the competitions we represented the school in. But when he told me what had happened, I was dumbfounded. I had no idea how to react. But for the moment, I went to the library and got another copy of the backyard science book to console my brother. But then we were out for summer vacation and I didn't think too much of it. Side note, in the summer we attended a science summit and my school friends and I won prizes for having the most efficient hydraulic gear based pulley system and the second fastest chemical fuel race boat. This was before I ever took a high school chemistry or physics course. This was announced in the school assembly the first day after summer break. When we came back for fall, I had a chem class with MD the first day of school. This was also right after the assembly where my group was given the award. So we go to the chem lab and MD's on the lab instructor's desk setting up an experiment designed to liberate hydrochloric acid fumes in a gas flask. Some moments passed by and we could see that some mistake had been done and there was no reaction in the mixture. Turns out the zinc granules were impure and rusted, but MD somehow got the idea that turning on the Bunsen burner on full blast would help the experiment. After collecting the gas for about 3 minutes, which is 2.5 minutes too long, since hydrochloric acid fumes are toxic if inhaled, she's satisfied. She then pulls up the flask to show the class how we do experiments. Cherry on the icing is when she opens the flask and brings it uncomfortably close to the girl beside me. MD says, does it smell pungent? The girl awkwardly smells it and jerks away. To someone who has no clue, that would be a plausible confirmation, but I knew it was complete horse crap. I could see that the girl knew about pungent fumes and cringed away on reflex, and not because it was actually pungent. I don't know why I did it, but at that moment, I snorted loudly. MD instantly zooms in on me, walking toward me with her face contorting into an ugly expression. She goes, something funny you'd care to share with us? I knew I messed up, but I was also angry. This person in front of me had bullied my younger brother and my dad. I remember that, and suddenly all my verbal sensors were shut down. I said, you and I both know that she didn't smell anything pungent. That experiment you just did was a failure. MD says, oh, you think you know more than me? Turning to the class, he knows more than me. You know what? I'll step down. Why don't you teach the class, Professor OP? I said, oh, absolutely. To the absolute shock of everyone watching, I walk up to the podium, and while maintaining eye contact with MD, I said, first thing to remember, class, turn to experiment one of your lab textbook. Read the warnings, the gas is pungent and poison. MD says, how dare you? Has no one taught you manners? This is no roadside shack, and you would do well to remember that, else you're gonna have a couple broken bones. This was in a different language, but if you want the exact translations, it was, I'll break your limbs and feed them to you. She's absolutely furious, grabs me by the hand and proceeds to drag me to the principal's office. On the way there, we cross the vice principal's office and he sees MD dragging me away and runs out. They say, what's going on here? 
Before I can say anything, MD starts ranting to him about how disrespectful and unacceptable my class behavior is and is heaving by the end of her spiel. The VP gives me a searching look and then responds with a, go back to class MD, I'll deal with him. We head back to his office and he offers me a seat and a glass of water. What actually happened in class OP? He asks with a sigh. I tell him exactly what happened. Once he hears my side of the story, he looks at me incredulously and asks me if I really went to the podium and started lecturing the class. I look up and see the gobsmacked look on the VP's normally reserved face. Imagine someone who looks like a male Minerva McGonagall being completely shocked. I couldn't stop myself. It started with a giggle which turned into full-blown laughter. I laughed till my stomach hurt and my eyes teared up. To my surprise, VP was also smiling wildly at that. He shook his head and that reserved expression was back. They said, I know that what happened there had you concerned for class safety, but that is no reason for such disruptive behavior. Aside from that, I'm personally going to investigate what happened in that class. And if MD is found to be intentionally forcing students to inhale harmful chemicals, she will be sacked immediately. Oh, and you're supposed to hand over a written apology to MD about this behavior. Now get moving. I sighed and headed back to class, and I really thought I'd ended MD's career. Oh, how wrong I was. She changed the story so it looked like she'd purposely done the experiment wrong and was about to reprimand that girl for inhaling what could have been a harmful chemical. MD pulled one on me and had me look like I was just an insolent child who thought that he knew everything by reading a chapter of the book. And here, I stopped myself. This event was me just going in head on with the teacher who had been in the school for longer than 35 years. Part 3. Pro Revenge Mode Now I knew that to help my brother, I needed to get rid of her. My dad knew about what happened in school and he wanted me to not engage MD. He said it wasn't worth it, but by now, I was in the game. She had played her card, it was my turn now. I don't know what made it so that she had such a problem with my dad and my younger brother. They were quiet and hardworking students. I felt she had something against our family and I was convinced that my younger brother would have to deal with the problem if I somehow messed up and got expelled or made a worse enemy out of MD. This was war and I had a new plan. I started to act really sheepish around her and made it a point to stay back after class and ask her questions in the most polite way possible. I was the kid who was guilty of not understanding the plans of elders. I portrayed myself as an amazing student who MD had succeeded in humbling. I slowly but surely made my way into the category best described by the term bootlicker. It hurt me inside to do it, but what I'd planned, if this went well, made me lightheaded with anticipation. I was in it to win it. I conceded defeat and a fight to win the war. Two years later, I'm in junior year. My younger brother just started high school and he was taking the chem class with MD. I was the highest scorer in chem and was a pet to MD. She started to like the OP I had portrayed and made me the lab assistant for that year. Two of my best friends knew what I planned. Everyone else in class hated me for being the teacher's pet and getting straight A's when the next highest grade was a B-. Everything was going according to plan. On the first day of class, I replaced her stool, one of the three-legged ones, with a broken stool. This was supposed to be the first in a series of pranks that would hit her that day. She came to class and went to take her seat, and boy, she fell. Well, somehow she hit her hand on the wall and cried out. Yep, that must have hurt. But she was definitely overweight, and it couldn't be traced back to me. I smiled on the inside as I rushed to her and helped her back up. I ran and fetched her another chair. While inside, the freshmen were trying their best not to laugh. When I got back from the room that had extra stools, I walked into the side of her screaming like a banshee. But what got me furious was that she was screaming at my younger brother. Apparently she said something like, stupid stools and stupid lab assistant fools. To which my brother responded with, it's not my brother's fault you're too heavy for the stool. Though I loved him for it, he really needed to learn where to come to my aid. But then I didn't do much and just replaced the chair silently, while silently trying to communicate to my brother to calm down. Nothing else of concern happened that day, till the time when school was over and the teachers were heading back. Stage 2 was in motion. 
We heard a loud bang, and immediately the large crowd of students nearby all headed towards the teacher's car parking lot. We saw MD's car smoking and her exhaust blown right off. Keep in mind it was an older car, and we decided to block off the exhaust with clay. That had hardened over the course of six hours on a sunny day. Well, that car had to be towed, and she went home with some other students that day. She didn't show up to school for two days after that. But she did show up to school on the third day, which was a half school day, because our country celebrates Teacher's Day. It's tradition that students go to their teachers, current and old, and wish them the best, give them cards, gifts, etc. This was by far the most ambitious prank pulled in the school that I know of. The two days that she was absent, we went around telling people to not visit her on Children's Day. It helped a lot that my friends and I were some of the most popular people in school, and with the other cool guys and girls agreeing to that, we spread the word and got confirmation that no one from the entire class in my year was going to go to her to wish her on Teacher's Day. But then what actually happened was something no one could have expected. I guess it could have been because we acted so fanatical about it, that our classmates spread the word to all their friends, and no one, not a single person in high school, went to her on Teacher's Day. It was the most amazing feeling of accomplishment I have ever had. She had made the situation for herself by being the nastiest person I've ever seen. It was no surprise that people were fine with doing this to her. For the first time in 70 years in our school, a teacher had not had a single well-wisher on Teacher's Day. Well, things are never perfect, and as it happened, word of what had conspired got to her. The next day, I'd just set up the lab. The freshmen were getting settled in, and here comes MD, anger radiating from her in waves. She walks up to me, and I get the hardest slap I've ever gotten in my life right across my face. I hate to admit it, but that left a blue mark on my cheek and my nose and lip bleeding. My younger brother, who saw that happening, ran towards me, but my shock slowly subsided, and I smiled a bloody smile that probably scared him. I told him to go get the vice principal. 20 minutes later, I was in the school emergency room with a nurse wiping my lip and me holding a cloth to my nose. The vice principal comes in with the principal and two cops in tow and they inform me that my parents have been informed and ask if I would like to talk about it now or when my parents are here. I say that I can answer their questions as soon as my lip is bandaged. So I tell them about the cases of bullying against my brother and I and also tell them that she's a really incompetent teacher. I tell the principal that he could check the school average in science subjects. And sure as I guessed, in the average scores in the national exams, we had physics and biology come in at 92 and 90, with chemistry at a surprising 79. Topping that off with assault charges, and she lost her license to teach two years before she retired, and with that lost amazing retirement benefits that the school offered. Her car also had no insurance. Huh. That's not all though. One could ask, what could be worse? Well, consider this. The fall she had off the stool had her go to the hospital for an x-ray of her wrist and hip that she suspected she might have broken. Well, the wrist sure had a hairline fracture. The hip was fine, but well, the x-ray showed another thing. I don't think it's normal for anyone to laugh when someone's diagnosed with stage three cancer, but I did. Also, I later met with her only living family member, her nephew, who had long cut all contact with her, but had been contacted by the police and the hospital. He'd flown back from the US for this. That's where I found out the truth. Well, I could have never have guessed what I found out there. MD's mom was my great granddad's niece. Through my great granddad's younger brother, who had stolen money from the family and tried to kill my great granddad. Well, he was disowned good crap, and no one knew this entire time. Well, not that anyone would care. Happy that the nasty woman is out of our lives, for good this time. Apparently she passed last year with no one by her side. I'm definitely not going to be the kind of person to celebrate any kind of outcome like that, but what I will say is if you're going to be a nasty person and treat people like that all throughout your life, throughout decades, it doesn't come as much of a surprise that When your time comes, there's nobody by your side. Considering the outcome for MD here, do you feel bad for them? Considering the way they treated people for decades? 
Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Father attempting to murder puppies leads to his own faked murder. This is my uncle's story, not mine. My uncle Mike used to have a friend that we'll call Jim. Jim owned a quiet mechanic shop at the beginning of a dead-end dirt road. Many people would drive down the road, dump things, and drive back by the shop. Jim and Mike would often sit in front of the shop and keep an eye on people driving by, as there would be some shady characters out there sometimes. In front of the shop, the road had a bridge that went over a river. One day, a family driving by stopped on the bridge. Jim and Mike's attention was alerted by children absolutely screaming from inside the car. They watched as the father, who was also the driver, threw a sack from the bridge into the river, then sped off down the dirt road. They saw that the bag was moving and immediately sprung into action, climbed down the embankment, and grabbed it. Inside the bag were seven tiny live puppies. Jim was a dog lover and was not having this. He knew that since the road was a dead-end road, the family would have to drive back by. He grabbed his shotgun and stood in the middle of the road, waiting. They pulled up and he had the gun drawn. They stopped and he ordered the father out of the car. The mother and two small children were terrified. He then marched the father down to the riverbank, out of sight of his family. He then screamed at the father for a good 10 minutes about animal abuse, his poor parenting skills, and some other choice not-so-nice words, then for good measure, fired a shot into the ground. This shot was heard by the family waiting in the car. Their eyes went wide and the kids started screaming again. The mother started crying and shrieking. It was another two to three minutes before the father walked back up to the car, completely fine and uninjured. I'm not agreeing with the actions here, but that sure was some revenge. Also, screw puppy murderers. I wholeheartedly agree with OP's last sentence here. You can't really condone the kind of action that was going on here, especially traumatizing the kids and wife. But if somebody is so cruel as to willingly throw a bag of live puppies off a bridge into the water down below, I ain't saying they deserve it, but they kind of deserve it. This next story is by Being Jack. She didn't give me my money back, so I ruined her life. I don't know if this is the right sub, but here we go. I'm male, 20, strongly believe in individualism and equality, currently in university. Jita, fake name, is probably under 24 and a clerk in a government bank. A good accomplishment for middle class Indians. We're both neighbors, live with our parents. It's normal and sort of compulsory in India, especially in small towns. We're neighbors for around 8 years. Our parents have okay relations with each other, and I have a good relation with her parents, and okay relation with Jita. We're both lower economical middle class, and socially from upper caste. Both her parents are liberal in the Indian sense, but in Western standards, they're very conservative. You can say this for the majority of Indian parents. February 2019, I had to deposit 112 US dollars. It's a large amount for lower middle class Indians. In the bank. I'm sort of lazy and didn't want to wait in queues in the bank. Also, Jita was in the same bank. So I thought I'd give her the money and she would deposit that in my account. I went to her house at 7am and called for her mother. She opened the gate. It turned out that her elder brother, 28, and mother and father went to temple. I told her why I came. She accepted the money and told me that she would keep the hard cash and transfer the money from her account the next day. Two weeks later, the money was still not deposited. I asked her about this several times, mainly from WhatsApp, but she just made excuses. At last, after three weeks, I went to her house and asked her to give them money instantly. I threatened her that I would tell her parents. After hearing that, she said this, What proof do you have that you gave me the money? Ask for money again, and I'll tell everybody that you're sexually harassing me. That was it. I became stiff as stone. My whole body became too heavy suddenly. I really had no proof. And I had WhatsApped her several times saying, Money hasn't been deposited yet, or... When will you deposit the money? Now, before any of you Western folks say that I exaggerated the situation, you have to view the situation through an innocent Indian person. India is basically the Middle East in terms of sex, personal space, and sexism. Google two-finger test in India. Also, legally, men can't be R-worded. But unlike the Middle East, it hides this fact through white lies. India has an assault problem, and this causes false accusation problems too. I've heard many false sexual harassment and R-word accusation cases. 
and have personally seen my distant rich cousin assault his neighbor due to land dispute violently. He simply used his beautiful clerk to charge him with a false sexual harassment case. The case ended with the neighbor being in jail for some time. Both my cousin and his neighbor had to bribe the police. June 2019, I hadn't talked with her again after that, but I had a plan to revenge her. By this time, I'd spied on her a bit and found out that she buys alcohol every alternating Saturday from X place and drinks it in her friend's place. Drinking alcohol is seen as immoral in the male population and 10 times as immoral in the female population in India. Also, she has a boyfriend, under 25, with whom she spends half an hour every Saturday evening with at X Park, which is on the other side of town. Having a boyfriend and girlfriend is seen as immoral in India, and you won't even get a rental flat easily if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend. I took photos of her both with her boyfriend and buying alcohol. First Saturday, July 2019, that day on my way to the park, I found a police SUV a mile away from the park. I thought maybe it's time to get this plan a step further. I told them that a couple's doing obscene acts in so-and-so park. The police officer replied in a very rude language. I knew I had to pay him, so I gave him 2,000 Indian rupees and he agreed to go. The park Jita used to go to was famous for unmarried couples, so on every Valentine's Day, the police used to harass the couples there. Upon reaching there, I told them the spot and began to watch the situation from a distance. I wasn't able to hear them, but the view was clear. Jita and her boyfriend were neither kissing nor hugging, they were just talking on the bench at that time. The police arrived and told them something. After that, the police slapped Jita's boyfriend a few times immediately. It appeared her boyfriend refused to give his parents' number. In India, if a police officer caught an under 30 unmarried couple, they demanded the victim's parents' numbers. The whole drama went on for 20 minutes. Both of them even fell to the police's feet. At last, they had to give some money to the police. This police behavior is pretty normal in India. Both looked pretty terrified that day. For Sunday, July 2019, I had already printed out all the images in 10 groups because there's 10 main houses in the neighborhood, including mine. In each set, there were three images of her buying alcohol and four images of her and her boyfriend together. I woke up at 4 a.m. and put all the sets of pictures in front of the 10 houses and went to sleep. I woke up with loud noises from Jita's house. I'd put one set in front of my own house too. I'm pretty sure her brother slapped her a few times. Her mother was calling her bad names like Randy, Hindi word for promiscuous. Her father was not in the house that day. I asked my mother about the situation and she told me to stay away from Jita. She told me that Jita had shamed the whole society with her childish behavior. August 1st, 2019, and the last month, she was forced to stay in the house by her parents. The whole neighborhood was disgusted by her, and her parents also charged a blackmailing case on Jita's boyfriend, which caused her boyfriend to spend a few days in jail, but he was released after a week. Her parents also tried arranging a marriage for her. It turned out that her boyfriend was from lower caste, which fueled the rage even more. She also needed a stitch on her lips because her brother literally cut her upper lip in half. September 15th, 2019, she'll be married next year. She had started going to the bank again. I still haven't gotten the money. So obviously, these cultures and living arrangements and just situations in general vary greatly from what I'm used to. That said, considering everything that happened to Jita in this story, do you think that was more than enough revenge for never paying OP back what was supposedly a large sum of money? Let me know in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by FancyCat11, Miss Nice Girl has left the building. First, I need to explain something. I seem like a very nice, laid back, easygoing person, so most people make the mistake of thinking I'm a spineless wimp they can take advantage of. Operative word there is seem. In point of fact, I have a vicious, vindictive temper. I'm just emotionally lazy. I don't like wasting time and energy on confrontation that can more profitably be spent elsewhere. However, if you mess with my family or my money, very bad things will happen to you. As my mom liked to say, Miss Nice Fancy has left the building, and you don't want to meet the other fancy. Example follows. This happened about 20 years ago. I started working as a CAD drafter for a small drafting and design firm. 
practically fresh out of college. I made a good salary, not great but comfortable. Very soon, I found myself the drafter, receptionist, office manager, file clerk, and even janitor when I needed to pick up a little extra money. My boss was almost never in the office because I was there to handle everything. After a year of being general factotum, on Friday, April 13th, my boss came to me and tells me he doesn't have my income tax paperwork ready, but has a reasonable excuse, and he asks me to file an extension. I told him, this is kind of last minute, don't you think? But okay, I'll do it. And I did. Every couple of weeks afterward, I'd ask him about my tax paperwork, and he'd tell me, no, not yet, and umpteen excuses, why not? Finally, he told me his lawyer had them and was finishing preparing them, and would be ready any day. Really? I did wonder why his lawyer was working on them instead of his accountant, but I didn't say anything. My tax extension would be up on Sunday, July 15th, so I had to turn in my taxes by Saturday, July 14th. On Friday, July 13th, about 5pm, I was sitting in my office chatting with my mom, who was there to give me a ride home. My boss came into my office and had the gall to ask me to file another tax extension and gave me some totally bogus excuse. You see, what he didn't know was, I had found all my tax paperwork on his computer a few weeks before, just needed to be printed out and signed off. So I knew then that he'd been lying his butt off this whole time. I remember staring at him for a few moments, absolutely dumbfounded, then smiling and saying okay. My mom told me afterward, when she saw me smile at him like that, she thought, oh crap, Fancy's gonna kill this guy and I don't know if I can stop her. I'm sure he wishes that's all I'd done to him. First thing Monday morning, I walked straight up to my boss and dropped my resignation on his desk. He's like, what the heck? And tried to argue. Me, I don't argue. I just told him, I'm leaving, do you want me to work my notice? He said, heck no, get your stuff and get out which was another huge mistake in a long line of them because I left and went straight to the IRS office where I gave up all the goods on this guy. He apparently never actually paid any of my taxes or his, though he did take it out of my pay and I had proof. It so happens before he was a CAD drafter and designer, he was a CPA who left that field under a cloud. The IRS was not happy to hear his name again. Everybody knows you do not mess with the IRS. Not content with that, I then contacted all of his business associates and told them what he had done. That he was being investigated by the IRS, and if they didn't want to be too, they might want to steer clear. I didn't tell his wife, whom I was on very good terms with, but only because I wanted him to have that pleasure. Just picture that conversation. Oh my god, why did OP leave? OP did everything. Um, well, I'm very sure she heard all about it from his associates. I'll give him this. He was stubborn. He managed to hang on to his business for about a year of living heck before going under. But I smirked every time I went by his empty office. To clarify, I never printed the tax paperwork from his computer. It honestly never occurred to me to do so. I used my own records of what I was paid and what tax was taken out of my salary to go to the IRS with. Since it was all in his handwriting, they accepted it. I was really just trying to give this guy the chance to do the right thing right up to the end. Or hang himself, whichever. It just kind of blows my mind that there's somebody that is willing to wait literally like a day before the last possible day to turn in your taxes and come in and say, hey, could you get an extension? and then repeat that again and say, could you get another extension? Like somehow just hoping that they would get away with it? Like eventually something's going to hit the fan because you're not giving the information to OP. Like are they hoping that OP would have just, I don't know, eventually just not did their taxes? I don't know what the actual exit plan here for this guy was. I think it was honestly a pretty doomed plan from the get go. Maybe they were trying to last till they could afford their plane ticket to Cuba. Guy steals my virtual stuff, gets screwed. During my middle school and high school years, I was really into an MMORPG called Maple Story. For those that are unfamiliar with this, it's basically an online game where you interact with thousands of real people while you level up your character, upgrade your equipment, and make money. It was extremely addicting, and I played this game probably more than I should have. 
Over the course of these years, I made many friends in this game, some of which I still talk to today. Then one day I met someone that I'll call Mark. Mark and I both played this game quite a lot. We began leveling up together and spent countless hours talking. Against my better judgment, and perhaps his as well, we gave each other our usernames and passwords so that we could borrow equipment from each other while one was offline. We began to have a stockpile of equipment shared between us on both accounts and basically shared everything. I bet you can see where this is going. What could possibly go wrong? I got back from school, logged in, and my character looked strange. Gone. Everything was gone. My mouth went dry. Mark and I had been friends for years at this point, and my first thought didn't even go to him. I thought some internet hacker got into my account. Of course, it was virtual, but it was still years of work that was just gone. I just stared at my empty inventory in disbelief. Mark is logged in. Mark is logged in. I message him and ask if his account is okay because my stuff is missing. He finds me and gives me a monologue. Don't even try to deny it. I know you took everything from me, so I went ahead and took everything from you. Goodbye. He doesn't give me a chance to reply, and he's gone. I try logging into his account, only to find he changed his password. I try to log back into my own account, and my password's changed as well now. He even changed my recovery email, so I was unable to change it back. This is the part that actually confuses me. Someone must have stolen his stuff, but I know it wasn't me. I could see the logic in his end that if I was the only one with his account information and his stuff went missing, it must have been me. But it wasn't, and he didn't bother talking it out. I would have given him half my stuff to get him back on his feet. Either way, he took everything and left me no choice. Now it's war. Mark had multiple game accounts. He gave me his username and password for one of his other accounts in this game. On a whim, I tried logging into it. It worked. He never changed it. I went into his game account maintenance page and found his backup email. The password for the game account worked for the recovery email. I had one of his email addresses. I saw he set up this email to be a recovery email for another one of his Gmail accounts. The same password worked for this email as well. This email was a recovery email for another one of his Gmail accounts. You guessed it, the exact same password. Through this chain process of recovery email addresses being linked to other email addresses, I obtained five Gmail accounts of his and promptly changed the passwords for them. Then I thought, I bet these Gmail accounts are linked to the game accounts. I was right. The backup email for my game account was linked to one of these five backup email addresses. His main game account was linked to another email address I obtained. I swiftly changed the password and backup email for all of my game accounts as well as his. I had everything of mine back, plus his game account and five email addresses. That should be good, right? This is where it gets good. I wasn't in this to just get even by this point. I wanted everything. By plugging in that single password and five of his email addresses, I obtained his Facebook, Instagram, and various other social media accounts as well. On this Facebook account of his, I found an interesting video of him and his girlfriend that his girlfriend sent him. I was thinking of what I could do with this. His girlfriend's dad was friends with him on Facebook. Hmm. I emailed him, I don't know exactly if I should tell you this, but Mark's been showing everyone this video at school and sent me a copy. I thought you should know. I attached the video. I acted like his classmate from anonymous email address and said Mark was showing everyone an interesting video of his daughter. The dad confirmed he was the girlfriend's dad and thanked me. I deleted the account and I never spoke to the dad again. During all this time, I gave another friend the other social media accounts and told him to wreak havoc with them. But don't do anything with the interesting video. The girl didn't ask for this, so I wasn't going to bring her down. I never got to see the fallout from the email to dad. It had to have taken a while to fix what my friend did to those social media accounts though. I haven't spoken to him since or played that game in many years. I still have the email addresses and game accounts. I don't know how he managed it, but apparently he's still with his high school girlfriend. I can rest easy knowing that holidays with dad must be awkward as heck. So going into the story, I thought it was awesome because when I was younger, I loved MapleStory 2. And MapleStory is definitely a game that's kind of rife with 
people who fall into phishing scams and get their accounts stolen and hacked and their money taken, so I was gonna be like, oh, this is kind of relatable. But then this went way further than I was ever expecting. Guess that's why it's nuclear. Did you ever make dumb decisions like that as a kid too? Similar to OP sharing his account with an online friend? Something you look back on and you're like, I was way too trusting. Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by jkalisi26. Don't mess with my little sister. I have twin sisters that are a couple of years younger than me. They are two of the sweetest little girls and avoid confrontation, almost the exact opposite of me. So because they're so sweet, they're prone to bullying, and because they're good looking young women, most of the bullying comes from girls who are jealous of them. The time of this story, I was 19 and they were 16. My first year of college, I was three hours away from home, so any bullying that happened couldn't be directly confronted or taken care of by me. That doesn't mean I wasn't involved. So apparently my younger sister had a new boyfriend that used to be involved with one of the head cheerleaders at my sister's high school. Knowing about a new relationship between the boy and my sister, a gang of cheerleaders started to bully my sister both online and in school. Daily, I would get phone calls from my little sister crying about being harassed. My advice to RKO them and cut their hair in class didn't work because, let's face it, neither of the twins had the balls to do anything about the girls. So instead, I took matters into my own hands and messaged all of the little cheerleading witches involved and let them know that if the bullying did not cease, I would make the three hour drive home and make them stop. This only encouraged more taunting and bullying so you can't fight your own battles for my sister. Since I went to the same high school, I'd known these cheerleaders. Actually had an affair with one of their older brothers and almost ruined his marriage, all a part of revenge for my sisters. But I also knew that our high school had a no tolerance truancy rule, and if you were caught leaving campus, you were immediately suspended and in big trouble. I used this to my advantage when I saw that the girls had left campus not only on a Friday, but in their cheerleading uniforms on a football game day and posted about their lunchtime adventure to Subway on Snapchat. I used this advantage and called the school pretending to be an upset woman whose car was almost hit by the cheerleader's car pulling out of the Subway parking lot. I asked to speak to the head cheer coach and made up a whole elaborate story about the girls cussing at me, almost hitting my car, wearing their uniforms and talking crap to me. The coach assured me the girls would have consequences and that they shouldn't even have been off campus to begin with. They ended up being kicked off the cheer team and put in in in-school suspension, a room where you sit in complete silence and do your schoolwork while not allowed to talk or socialize or have your phone for a whole week. They never cheered again, which was a big deal, because they would post on social media about how much they love to do it. I called my little sister and told her what I did, and she was amazed at how clever I was and how it played out. Every day she saw them in suspension, she would text me and tell me what horrendous things were happening to them while they sat with the special needs kids at lunch and weren't allowed to leave anywhere. And this, my friends, is another downside of social media. Back when you're a kid doing kid things, skipping school or cutting out of class early or sneaking away. If you're so addicted to social media, it's hard for you not to be like, here we are at Subway. All it takes is one parent to see that Snapchat or some teacher or somebody from the school and you're doomed. But in this case, they definitely had it coming to them. Our next story is by Almost Mental. My bully of three years finally pushed me too far. When I first started middle school, I ended up with my first girlfriend. This pissed off her ex, so began three years of bullying. All the standard stuff, hitting, stealing from me, so on and so forth. He even ruined my bike while it was locked up once. Every time he pulled some crap, I did the right thing and reported every event. For almost three years, none of which led to any real repercussions for the little crap. Now all of this leads up to the end of 8th grade. Me and my best friend are leaving gym class when lo and behold here comes my bully. He runs up to me shoving me to the ground saying something to the effect of been walking long f word. At this point I was pretty numb to his bs. My friend goes to help me up when the bully does something new. He hit my friend. I don't remember the next few minutes. What I do remember is suddenly finding myself being pulled backwards away from the bloodied and mangled face of my bully. 
I can still remember how my knuckles throbbed, the skin completely destroyed, blood dripping down my fingers. I turned to the security guard that was now holding me up and asked him, Freak, what did I do? Now I don't know how much of this next bit is true, as it's told from my friend's point of view, but apparently the moment my bully touched my friend, I exploded into an animalistic rage, tackled him to the ground and started swinging like Rocky. He didn't even have time to scream before I knocked him the freak out. He ended up in the hospital for a month with a broken nose, orbitals, jaw, and the back of his skull. I was told by the administration to keep my mouth closed about them not doing anything about the bully for three years, and in return his injuries would be declared an accident from tripping on a curb. I still have nightmares of his bloodied face every now and again. Normally, in situations where it does come to a fight, I almost never would advocate for anybody to keep going after they were knocked out, but imagine being in a situation where you're tormented and beaten up and bullied for three years, and then they try to extend that to your friend that you care about. Honestly, OP going into a rage, blacking out and just the results being the results, you kind of get why it happened. This next story is by Livid Unlawfulness. Harass and peep into our windows? Burn down your patio. So I lived in this trailer park growing up for about 16 years. It used to be pretty nice until they kept changing owners. Eventually the newest owners hired a security guy. Dude was a straight up freaking creep. He'd write down everyone's plate numbers, knock on your door and barge in without permission to look inside, to see if he could get a fine for something inside, look inside people's windows, etc. He even thought he was a cop and had lights put on his security car, which the local PD made him remove. We called the police and they said they couldn't do anything about it, or whatever, because our trailers were on their property. One of my family members was and still is a mechanic. So we acquired some of the oil he drained out of customers' cars, dumped it onto the guy's lawn, which killed it, then doused his patio equipment with flammable substances and lit it on fire. Guess what? He never so much as even looked at the general direction of anyone's windows ever again. I mean, whether or not this guy's hired, if you've got your own tight-knit, very close, small community, and you've got this certified, genuine creeper going around harassing people, sometimes the community's just gotta work together to run that guy out of there. And our final story of the day is by Dovakin. Spoiled brat gets spoiled fruit and fish. It was just another Saturday afternoon, me and my friends just hanging out at our local park, talking and laughing. Everything goes well until Craphead, a spoiled brat who likes to one-up everyone, comes along. At this point, I'd like to mention that I'm a 6 foot 1, 209 pound male metalhead with quite some muscle and a background of martial arts. I'm the quiet big guy that cares for everyone. Anyway, Craphead comes up to us to tell us about the new phone his dad bought him. We try to act like we cared, but Craphead probably wanted us to worship him or something, and the dialogue went something like this. He said, so what do you guys think? Friends 1 to 3 said, pretty cool, man. I said, nice. Craphead asks, is that all? At this point, I feel like we're going to have a good time. I said, yeah, man, it's not that you got a new house. It's just a phone. I'm happy that you like it, but chill. Big mistake. Craphead says, you're just jealous of me because you can't afford one, you poor freaks. I was furious, but decided to not take action. My friends were baffled from this and couldn't talk. I say, at least we use our phones to talk to each other to meet up and go out, not to entertain yourself to adult entertainment in HD. I then turned on my phone and put on my earbuds. He went ape poop and slapped me in the face and broke my screen. I stood up and all I could think of was, destroy him. And my friends just stood there looking at me. I say, you'll pay for my phone and you'll not come close to me or my friends ever again. I said as calm as I could. He proceeds to slap me and call me a poor runt. I go nuclear. I grab him by the collar and bring him to the ground, making sure he was as comfortable as possible. He tries to hit me but fails miserably. I grab him by the collar and the belt and lift him a half a foot in the air. I want you guys to know that the angrier I get, the more twisted my humor gets. So I tell my friends to open a garbage bin and they do it in seconds. Crabhead was wearing all white expensive clothes. I throw him inside, close the lid, and seal the bin with a rope. A day later, I hear they got that guy out of the garbage bin three hours later by the garbage truck driver, 
who cut the rope because he heard screaming and gagging from within. That was the last I heard from Dear Craphead, and believe me, I am happy. As much as I want to believe that they tied this dude up in a garbage can and was later found by the garbage guys, it feels a little hard to believe. That said though, in any situation, in no way should you go up to a 200 pound, 6 foot 1 metalhead that is described as being pretty built and figure, yeah, let's mess with this guy. Over a decade later, I got revenge on my abuser. Background is short and sweet, just like the rest of the story. When I was a young lass, I was assaulted by an adult male who volunteered at the school I went to. It went on that entire year, and the next year, I had the good fortune to change schools for totally unrelated reasons. Due to standard issue threats and manipulation that come with these scenarios, I'll kill your family if you ever tell them and take you to live with me once they're dead, what we do is a special secret that nobody else can ever know, etc. I never told anyone. I pushed it down and just tried not to think about it. Many years later, I had a friend confide in me that something similar had happened to her, and we swapped stories. She had done things the proper, tidy way. She told a trusted adult, the perpetrator was tried in a court of law, he was convicted, and he was jailed for a long time. Everything wrapped up nice and neat with a little bow on top. She was pissed at me for not telling anyone about what had happened to me, even if it hadn't been until years later. Because what if it had happened to someone else? But I pointed out that once it was past the statute of limitations, I couldn't really tell anyone. Doing so when he wasn't tried and convicted would come back on me as slander, so it felt like there wasn't anything I could do. For a while, I left it at that, but it started to nag at me. Was there really nothing I could do? I started by looking him up online. A basic Google and social media search were all I needed to find him. Living far away from where I was, and I wasn't sure if that meant good or bad things for my revenge, whatever it turned out to be, as I had no definite plan then. On his very public profile, I got some news that rattled me. He had terminal cancer. It didn't seem like he was going to drop dead the next day, but still, it was now or never if I wanted to get some kind of closure from him. So I requested him on social media, and he accepted. I sent him the first message. Hey, I'm OP from school. Do you remember me? He answered yes, and that was it. I asked for his phone number. I just want to talk to you. He said he didn't think it was a good idea. I said, it's been so long, there's nothing that could happen. I'm not mad, just sad more than anything, and I just want to talk. Now that I'm older, I want to understand. He believed me, and I got his number. I tried calling him immediately, straight to voicemail. He said he would set up a time for us to talk. Okay, fine. I can be patient. It only gave me more time to think about what I would do. About a week later, I called him and he picked up. I barely remember this conversation and went through a lot of it on adrenaline, shaking like a leaf. He sounded sick. Old and sick. Not intimidating like he used to be. Not scary. Not anymore. He asked me what I wanted and why I was talking to him after so long. I said, I just need to hear from you what you did to me so I know I'm not crazy. He said he couldn't do that. I told him he owed it to me and that it had been so long ago, the statute of limitations was expired so there was nothing that could be done about it. I said that I knew he was dying and that it would clear his conscience to talk about it and answer all of my questions. Win-win, right? He still said no. So I told him that was a shame, and that I'd hope to get closure from him, but I guess asking his wife and son that I'd seen on social media would have to be enough. This was a bluff on my part. I knew that by telling him that, he could do preemptive damage control. If this didn't work, I'd be out of luck. He said fine. He first said in a very bland sort of way, I was inappropriate with you back then. Not good enough. I pushed and pushed until I almost thought he was going to hang up, and he finally admitted it in detail. I thanked him and asked if his conscience felt better. He said yes. I said good. That was all I wanted for both of us. I hung up. Now the actual revenge part. I'd recorded the whole thing. Not illegal. I was in a one-party consent area, and although he lived in a different area, he did too. I uploaded it to cloud storage and sent a link to his wife and his adult son. I explained that I'd found them as a mutual contact on social media, and since he was nearing the end, I thought they might appreciate knowing some of the memories he shared with me about the time he volunteered at that school. I never got a reply from his wife. I didn't expect one, but still, I was a little disappointed. It took about three months, but then I finally got a message from his son. 
It was glorious. He wasn't the guy's son, he was his stepson, and he never liked the guy from day one. He told his mom this repeatedly, but she insisted he was just bitter about his bio dad leaving and told him to get over it. Something just felt off about him, and now he knew what it was. He apologized to me for how the guy had hurt me, not that it was any of his fault. They didn't even know him back then yet. He told me that he knew his mom hadn't replied to me, but she had listened to it. Afterwards, she left him while he was dying of cancer. The stepson said this guy didn't have a family of his own and that he and his mom and his own kids were all he had left. They severed ties with him. Best part, the wife never actually married him and even if she had, when she left, it wasn't exactly like there was time for the guy to contest anything in court. He was fading fast and that stuff can take a year or more to get settled. He didn't have that kind of time. When she left, she took all the money It was all hers, he hadn't worked in a long time due to the cancer. She took the closest thing he had to family, and the best part, without her, he no longer had the money to pay for his private health insurance. I thanked the stepson for contacting me and asked if he could do me one more favor, tell me when it was over and he was gone. He happily agreed. A few more months later, I got the news. He died alone in a state hospital. They weren't going to publish an obituary, although the stepson had decided to have him cremated so that he could scatter the ashes. No plot, no lasting proof that this man ever existed. Apparently, he had spent the last few months writing constant letters to his now ex and stepson, calling them, texting them, everything. Neither one had responded, and he died alone, knowing that what he had done had eventually ruined his life and taken away what mattered to him. I thought it was a pretty fitting ending, although in the end, vengeance just felt meh. I always wish I hadn't believed him back then, and had just told someone. First of all, I greatly appreciate OP sharing such a powerful story, and it really highlights some of the things that I think society needs to focus on as much as they can as a whole, where it's just making sure that the kids and the youth know that it's okay to reach out in situations like this where they just feel even uncomfortable or reinforcing that despite the threats, nothing bad is going to happen to them for speaking out. Do you guys feel like the outcome for this assistant was fitting for what they did? Or do you guys feel it was only a taste of what they really deserved? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is by Perfect Hamburger 812 Steal my money, take my house, put me into debt? Now it's time for me to ruin your life. My ex stole from me close to 90,000 euros, which I saved up for 9 years. And when I took her to court, I lost due to lack of evidence. At the moment, I felt destroyed and lost it all. She even sued me for emotional damages and I had to pay 55,000 euros. So I was forced to sell my house and take a big loan from the bank. I stayed at a friend and helped me find some good lawyers, and we just found an amazing one. And one day, he helped me so much, and even helped me get the info of who took my money from my bank account. Something was wrong. The 29th of June, a transaction happened in my name. I never made it. I wasn't in the country at that time. Well, would you look at that. I was ready to get back into court when I found out that she bought my house. Well, I have a safe that I never told her about hidden in the bathroom behind the cabinet. Well, she ruined my life. Why not ruin hers even more? So I had an accomplice that helped me buy some drugs, worth about 400 euros, and used a friend to hide it there. The safe has a four digit code, that being 0000, never got to change it to something else. And before taking her to court again, I had that same friend who hid the drugs turn her in. It took about a week for the cops to receive a mandate to search the house. They found nothing in the first two hours, and they wouldn't if my friend forgot to leave the safe cover open. That 400 euro worth of drugs are equal to a 5,000 euro fine and 12 years of prison. Well, I'm not done yet. Court time again. I had my lawyer get the footage from when the money from the bank was transferred and also I had a document showing that I was not in the country at that time. We also found out the account to which the money was sent to. The name was that of my ex. Well, look how the tables have turned. My lawyer also demanded payment for emotional damage, all the money that was stolen, the house, and also money equivalent to two times the debt I had in the bank, which is equal to about 140,000 euros. 
The look on her face when everything came crashing down on her was totally worth it. And on top of the 12 years from drug possession, she received an additional 25 years for theft and false testimony. Enjoy it, witch. I mean, that's just completely ruining their life. Those are some very harsh punishments. I feel like if this happened in America, like, yeah, it would be jail time, but I don't think they would be in jail for, what, 37 years? All I know is this is definitely a nuclear revenge. And our final story of the day is by E. Dale 1. Fever teacher gets wrongfully fired, so I get three-fourths of the staff arrested. I'll start off by saying this happened to my sister, and the actions taken were hers. My sister has always gotten along very well with her teachers and has a habit of forming actual friendships with them to the point that she still talks to her fifth grade English teacher, along with many others, decades later. This happened about 15 years ago. My sister was a student at Job Corps, a government-run, live-on-campus vocational training program studying hotel and motel management. She got on extremely well with her hotel motel management teacher better than pretty much every teacher she'd already had up to that point. One day, the teacher goes to the center dean's office and walks in on a paper-shredding session. It turned out that there was some pretty major embezzling happening at the center, as in more than 60% of the funds for the center were being stolen. The teacher was appalled, and despite some rather lucrative offers made, refused to join in on these acts. Less than a week later, the teacher was fired for trumped up reasons. This was especially bad given the teacher was only two years away from retiring and being fired lost the retirement package. Needless to say, my sister was pissed. Knowing how things typically work and that almost any report she tried to make would just be swept under the rug, if it was taken seriously at all, she came up with a plan and took things nuclear. Over the next month or two, my sister managed to gather some basic evidence of the embezzling. Nothing concrete, but enough to warrant considerable investigation by the authorities. She took the little evidence she was able to gather, along with the story of what happened to her teacher, and sent the info in an email to the Job Corps regional director. Now, like I said, she knew that her email would likely be ignored, or the event swept under the rug, so she got smart. The email was cc'd to every single major person in the Job Corps chain of command, all the way up to the national director, as well as to anyone even tangentially related to Job Corps and the upper echelons of the Department of Labor, and every member of Congress as well as the US President's office. Remember, this was a government-run program. All in all, the email was sent to over 2,000 people. Basically, she not only sent the report, but sent it in such a way that everyone who got it could also see everyone else who got it, and she sent it to way more people than would be needed to ensure the issue couldn't be swept under the rug. Two weeks later, after the investigation finished, never seen the government work so fast on anything that wasn't collecting owed taxes, Only five or six staff members out of the 20-ish that worked in the center still had their jobs, and at least five of the ones fired, including the dean, were facing major criminal charges, with the rest facing minor charges. I'm not sure of the exact figure on how much was stolen, but it was well into the seven digits. The embezzling had been happening for years. The teacher got a very nice severance package post-investigation. If I recall correctly, it was three years of pay, her full retirement package, and signing an NDA, though she didn't get her job back. And my sister was given her completion certificate despite not having finished the requirements of the course. They wanted her gone, but couldn't kick her out. The story actually kind of reminded me of something I thought I heard sometime recently where it was like, If you're doing a course at a college and all of a sudden like the professor's gone or they can't teach that course, they're like required to just give you the certificate or the degree or something. Although having said that, it sounds like an absolute crackpot Twitter conspiracy like Coca-Cola and Pop Rocks conspiracy theory. But straight up, they did the right thing here. Not only was it nefarious action going on, but they were stealing from the program and ultimately affecting the quality of the education as a whole of anybody that was going there. 
It's good these people were caught when they did because this thing probably could have just kept going on and on for years and years further. Revenge on my cheating fiancé was bad, but the karma was brutal. This happened to me about 1999, 2000, when I was 19 to 20 years old. My friend told me that this was the juiciest revenge and karma he's ever heard of and that I should post it here. If you've ever been cheated on by someone you love, this is for you. I was single after around 5 years with my then boyfriend and had finally mustered the courage to tell my junior high school crush, let's call him DN for douche nozzle, about the candle I'd been holding for him for the past 7 years, ever since the first time we met. I was still somewhat new to the Pacific Northwest after leaving my home of Alaska and figured, well, he's in Alaska and I'm here and never moving back, so I might as well let the unspoken thing be spoken get the answer I'm sure is coming, and move on with my life. I was pretty sure that once I laid down all the cards, he wouldn't have wanted to be friends with me anymore, or would have said something like, I'm not into you that way. I was expecting, at most, an awkward conversation with him that may have explained my behaviors over the years I'd known him. Much to my surprise, he reciprocated my expression of sincere love. Deanne and I had been friends for all that time, and though I never dropped hints to him about it, I did tell my closest friend at the time. He and I even kissed once during our first school year together, and even though I wanted to, I didn't ever press the issue or pursue him further, giving him the chance to take the lead, which he didn't. His words to me were poetic and so full of promise, including him saying how, I always had a thing for you and never knew how to approach you, and... I was so afraid you would reject me and I'd be humiliated and so on. The same kind of stuff I would told him. Seven years later, having not the slightest clue that he was going to react that way at all, it made me question my decision about never moving back. I mean, never. After the phone call professing love for each other, that word, never, seemed so extreme. If I relaxed that decision, maybe I could have the opportunity for the relationship I'd wanted for so long. I had a really great perk with a family member who was a pilot and was able to fly on a buddy pass or standby ticket pretty often. So I decided to fly up to Alaska every couple of weeks to see DN. Once the news got around, everyone in our circle of friends would exclaim, Oh my god, you plus DN. I always hoped you two would end up together. You're the perfect couple. I thought it was super cheesy and romantic, but it actually felt validating and nice because that was what I had envisioned and hoped people would say about us. I was always very careful to avoid dating or even flirting with anyone I went to school with, for the sake of avoiding interpersonal drama and gossip at school, which would have disrupted so much more than my education. After several months of traveling to see him every couple of weeks, he asked me to marry him. I said yes, and then without hesitation started planning to move back to Alaska to be together and start our life there in our hometown. I made my plans for the move, packing up all of my belongings and parcel shipping everything I owned. Thankfully it wasn't much because I was still so young and didn't own any furniture. Deanne and I were going to live together at his place where he had a roommate. Let's call him Bicycle Man, who I will never forget and the reason why is coming up. In the scant number of days before my final flight back up to Anchorage, I started feeling kinda icky and gross. And after several days of that, followed my intuition and took a pregnancy test. I found out I was pregnant, and I was so overjoyed that I called him one evening to tell him about it. There was already a party going on at his place. I spoke with DN briefly and said, I have some news I want to share with you. And he said, but first, I have to tell you about this really cool artist chick. And he told me about this girl who came to the party, let's call her Thought. Yes, a terrible nickname used only because I'm too lazy to think of a better acronym, and it made me laugh when it first occurred to me. I was irked by the way he was talking about her, and realized this is not the time for a big reveal. I think I said something to DN like, don't do anything you'll regret. He asked me to call him later on to tell him whatever the news was, so I said I would, and then I did. Hours later, whoever answered the phone said that DN was there, but couldn't come to the phone right now. I had this awful stomach sinking feeling because I already had an intuitive feeling about what was happening. DN never called me back that evening. I called him the next morning, no answer. I was heartbroken. That evening, I finally got to talk with him and reminded him how I have news, but he interrupted me to say, I have to tell you something. 
and my stomach sinking feeling was now turning to nausea. He admitted that he cheated on me with thought, all while the time I was trying to reach him the night before. I hung up the phone on him and threw up. He didn't call me back to ask what my news was. I called him back later on to verbally upbraid him and all he could do was ask for forgiveness and tell me that it was a mistake and that he still wanted me to come there. I told him there was no chance I would marry him after that. That was not a mistake, buddy. That was a choice. I said I would be up there to get my things and then I'd be gone for good. It took every ounce of my emotional strength to verbalize my thoughts without screaming. I miscarried the pregnancy that week. Add that onto the absolute devastation that this person I'd longed for after all these years didn't actually intend on a committed relationship after proposing to me, and then I had to deal with the immense pain of losing my first pregnancy. And then to top that off, I had to fly up to Anchorage weeks before Christmas to pick up all of the stuff I had already parcel shipped there, wait for it to arrive, with nowhere else to go but Deanne's home. I had to face him and be around him after having my heart thoroughly crushed. I knew also that all of our mutual friends and our families would either learn the truth or would be told lies if Deanne tried to save face about his mistake. I didn't know Deanne to be that kind of person, but then I didn't know him to be a cheater either, so all bets were off when it came to an educated guess about what course of action he would take. So I got on the plane, flew up north to Alaska, and of course, Deanne didn't remember he told me the day before that he'd pick me up at the airport, or he didn't think it was worth it, whatever it was. It was the most awful feeling to be forgotten about and left there stranded. Even more humiliating was when an elderly couple at the airport saw me waiting alone, picked up my lost girl vibe, and asked me if I was okay, and I lost my calm demeanor and broke down in tears in the airport. I shooed away the well-meaning couple because I couldn't keep my crap together long enough to be gracious about any help they could have offered. I finally got a cab and went out to his place, banged on the door outside, and waited until I couldn't feel my fingertips anymore. The racket finally woke up Bicycle Man who let me inside. Dn was in his room, passed out on his bed. I went to the living room couch and waited. I didn't know exactly how to confront him, so I didn't. He already knew how I felt based on our phone call following his confession. I acted like I no longer cared about it because the last thing I wanted was to be seen as a crazy ex. There was no way I was going to let his behavior and choices besmirch my reputation. So I acted cool and dispassionate, as if it were all just a matter-of-fact end to a relationship. I kept to myself as much as possible. DN must have taken that as some sort of sign that we were just friends or only friends, as if we'd never had a relationship, as if he'd never asked me to marry him. And he had the bright idea to invite Thought over to meet me. As it turned out, DN told Thought that I was just a friend, and he never told her about our relationship engagement, me visiting frequently to see him, me moving there to be with him, etc. It was like I was erased and discarded. Looking back, this is a very clear case of a narcissist relationship pattern of idealize, devalue, discard. Every moment between arriving there and leaving felt like it was just me crying and feeling so incredibly hurt that it broke my whole world. I had sacrificed my family, who had all moved to the Pacific Northwest by that point, I left my job so that I could move back to Alaska and be with DN. I was so into the idea of a relationship with him, it didn't even feel like I'd sacrificed for the sake of our relationship. But I did. And it hit me that I sacrificed family and job who had never hurt me, at least not in the way DN had hurt me. I regretted leaving them to be with DN and his empty promise of love. When the news spread to our mutual friends and his family, No one could understand why Dn and I were split up. While everyone understood why I was crying and upset, no one really knew what to do with the constant stream of tears. I maintained my composure as being the not crazy ex to the best of my ability. This all happened in front of people who knew both of us for years. They were dumbfounded about Thought and what she was doing with Dn. They put the puzzle pieces together themselves. I kept my mouth shut and only stated facts when I was asked. Yes, DN would rather be with her, so he's with her. I'm here waiting for my things to arrive so that I can ship them back, and then I'm getting on the next flight out of here. 
One day, out of the total around two weeks I was there, Bicycle Man came out of his room and saw me in my silent waterfall of tears and just said to me, DN is a total jerk. If I were you, I would be crying too. For some reason, that made me feel better about the whole thing. Bicycle Man was a muscly, bad-to-the-bone guy to a young woman like me, and for him to say that made me feel like the world wasn't such a cruel place after all. I still had not told anyone about the pregnancy or the loss because even though I was grieving and in pain, if I mentioned any of that, I knew that I would be treated like a crazy ex who was making up stories to make him feel worse or make it all about poor me, and I just didn't need any more BS on top of that. I suffered in silence and perfected the art of crying without making a sound so that I wouldn't draw anyone else's attention to my grief. Over those two weeks, DN invited thought over frequently. He probably thought it was no big deal to me. He wasn't thinking about me or how his behavior was affecting me. I was in a state of shock. I never thought he would treat me like that. After I'd known him for so long and had never seen him behave in that way. I stayed on the couch while the two of them had their fun in DN's room within earshot. A move that, like, is such a jerk thing to do that I'm still surprised it didn't instantly place his likeness in the dictionary under the definition of sociopath. I didn't have the energy to confront Dien or to argue as to why doing something like that was cruel and heartless. If he didn't know that already, me telling him wasn't going to teach him the basics of empathy. I was so angry at him that I wanted to hurt him even worse than he had done to me. Before I left... I concocted a plan to poison his new relationship with thought. This is where the revenge plot comes into play. I'm bisexual, and I knew that thought was at least flexible in that regard, and obviously she was willing to move fast with someone. So, at yet another party night, a seemingly regular occurrence at that house, I got thought all to myself before she got drunk for long enough to seduce her. I shut both of us in DN's room. Meanwhile, everyone else was getting too drunk to get that anything could have been happening in there. DN was occupied with the guests and may not have noticed we were missing. After we were finished, I told her why I was there and told her about my history with DN. With an icy and dispassionate apathy that illustrated how much DN was dead to me, I told her, If he cares enough about me to propose to me and then do what he did with you after I've known him for years, just imagine what he'll do to you. Suddenly, she understood why I'd been so somber when I was introduced to her. She had no idea that I was anything more than an innocent friend of DN's. She didn't know why I was there in Alaska or why I was waiting for boxes. She didn't know anything. She felt profoundly guilty and regretful, despite the fact that she didn't know any better. She had been deceived, and I'd been too gracious to lose my cool or cause a scene at a house party or in front of anyone else, as would have been expected. When I was in private with her, I told her everything, including how I pined after him when I was 12 years old because my adolescent hormones didn't know better. Dien walked in on us and must have assumed that nothing was wrong, only because nothing violent or terrible was happening in the moment. That was either hubris or drunkenness on his part. There was no confrontation again. The party went on, and the other girl left. The next day, Dian asked me what I was doing with the other girl. I said to him, she was an easy piece of butt, and I'm not surprised you were able to get busy with her the same day you met her. I just happened to do the same thing you did. I didn't see her that way. I said that to her because that was the most emasculating thing I could think of. The look on his face seemed to suggest that his hot dog had shriveled and inverted into his body. He looked more mortified than I've ever seen him. I still played my poker face. He didn't know what to say after that, so he said nothing and changed the subject. I made him feel just as small and insignificant as he had made me feel. Mission accomplished. Or so I thought. There's more. I got my belongings finally and shipped them all straight back to where they came from. I got myself on another flight out of there a day or so later, didn't ever see the other girl again. I didn't hear from DN again for the next five years. Five years later, I was married and had just learned that week that I was pregnant with my first child. I got an email from DN. He tracked me down through social media back in 2005. He said that he wanted to catch up with me, and so I obliged him with a phone call, thinking I was going to gloat about being married and having a kid or some crap. 
Tian told me about all the karma that went down after I left. Said, you didn't go crazy while you were here, but whatever you did planted a seed that grew into something that destroyed my life. He didn't say that word for word, but close to it. I think he used the word cancer in there somewhere. Perhaps my intentions to avenge my dead fetus invited my guardian angels, demons may be more likely, to intercede in the situation. Karma, in order of appearance. The other girl cheated on him with his best friend, and then moved in with the dude only two weeks after I'd left. Ouch. He got fired from his job on Xmas Eve. His boss was another mutual friend, who heard about what he did to me, decided he didn't want the guy working at his video store anymore. Ouch. His truck broke down in front of an electrical station, got impounded. He didn't have enough money to get it out, since he lost his job, so he lost his truck too. Ouch. That's pretty bad when you live in a place like Alaska in the middle of winter. His family caught wind of what went down with me and disowned him. Ouch. I thought that was pretty extreme. What did they hear? I never found out, but just chalked it up to karma. After the other girl was gone, his remaining friends unsurprisingly threw another drinking party at his place. Except that time they got Dian wasted drunk and then beat the crap out of him and threw him out of his own home into a snow berm and locked him out. He took refuge with a neighbor but later on had to leave the state because he'd been shunned by all of his remaining friends, had no family or job or truck, and was now single without even a thought to lean on. When we spoke, he'd been living in Texas and rethinking his life and wanted to know how I was doing after our engagement friendship ended. And that was when I decided that that was the right time to tell him about the baby we could have had. And then Distinguished Guests was when he started to cry. And I told him how much it sucked for me to feel like I couldn't have told him about it before. And then I heard his full on ugly cry on the other line. He was sobbing on the other line and couldn't stop apologizing. He said, I had no idea you were pregnant. I felt a momentary indignant rage and sublimated it for another poker face moment in my matter of fact emotionless response. We had sex, so it's not like it was impossible for that to happen. I tried to tell you. At the time, it was more important for you to confess your horrible choice than listen to my news. You didn't have any idea that I was pregnant because you didn't care to know. You didn't even ask. More sobs on the other end of the line, and more apologies than I've ever heard in my life from anyone. I ended our call by saying, It's really okay. I don't hate you. I wanted to say, I pity you, but held my tongue. I said, Things are better for me now. I'm married, and we just found out that we're pregnant with our first child. Anyway, it's really been nice catching up with you and finding out what happened with your life. Sorry to hear it's been difficult. Let's keep in touch. He didn't. I don't know why he bothered contacting me in the first place, because he must have had some idea how that call was going to go down, but he probably wasn't counting on finding out that he could have been a father and we could have had a family together if only he hadn't crushed the heart of someone who actually cared about him. In hindsight, that relationship was nothing more than me confusing his charm, his words, 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 and my infatuation and pining away for actual love. I spent so much time wondering and questioning what I'd done to deserve him doing all of that to me. What I didn't realize was that he didn't do any of that because of me or to punish me for any reason. He did all of that because the only person he'd been thinking about was himself. It took me many more years before I would learn how to identify narcissistic behavior. And now, looking back, I realized that I'd narrowly escaped getting myself stuck in Alaska and romantically committed to a person who has little capacity for empathy and doesn't feel remorse when he wrongs someone. I learned how to get revenge by maintaining my grace and composure, stating only the facts, keeping my emotions to myself and my demeanor together just long enough to plant doubt in the heart of the new and other woman. Five years after we crushed my heart, he cried enough to fill a bottle with his tears and my satisfaction poured it over the flowers on the grave of our tiny dead fetus. I'm sorry, baby. Do you think what OP did here was brilliantly played out? Or do you think there's elements to it that they could have done better? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Nuclear Ghosting Revenge on Cheating Fiancé The players are myself, fiancé, fiancé's mom, the time frame is 2013 to 2016. 
It's obviously been several years since the incident, and I literally have never told anyone in my new life about this. Tonight, I have some good wine to drink and figure I'll let my fingers do the talking. I thought I had met the perfect woman. We met in the last year of college. We met at a party and hit it off instantly. She was a beautiful blonde with sun-kissed skin and she could have been a model. Think Kate Upton type figure. She was kind, compassionate, sympathetic, good listener and had an active life with many friends. She liked my friends and it was awesome how over the three years we knew each other, how our friend groups merged. Several of our friends began dating each other. It was some of the best times of my life. I was on for a postgrad in finance and she had a degree in contractual law. This is just to say we ended up being successful in our own rights. But I'm no slouch in the looks department either. 5'11", 190 pounds, and like the gym. I wasn't a super athlete, but let's just say I was built. But I was and am very shy and didn't have a lot of prior relationships prior to meeting her. The first evening we met, we were smitten. First night, we talked all night. Then it went to texting and phone calls daily, then dates weekly, then after a year... When I started working on my new job, she moved in. I loved her family and her family loved me, mostly her mother as her father was standoffish, as he was to everyone. It was a whirlwind of romance. After two and a half blissful years of overseas vacations, hiking trips, and luxury vacations, I proposed to her. She said yes, I was over the moon. She was doing all the planning for the wedding. We were talking about our futures together, buying a house children and family trips that we were going to take together and all such things like that then it happened one evening after we both get home to our apartment she's a little distant i think i noticed it right away as we were always very affectionate towards each other this would only happen about once a week for the first month after proposal then it was more frequent i would have been none the wiser except that i used to listen to a lot of reddit on youtube so i waited and observed These bouts of ignoring me would only last a couple of hours, then she would be right back to normal. But after six months, wedding in a year, she was like this almost every night. Sex was still great, relationships with her parents was still great, but over Thanksgiving at her parents' home in Louisville, but over Thanksgiving at her parents' home in Louisville, Kentucky, we live just north of DC, she was standoffish towards me in front of her mother. Now her mother was a very observant woman. She pulled her daughter aside to talk to her, and I could hear them arguing. After some heated but muffled words, they returned to the rest of the family and carried on like nothing was going on. I figured I could ask her about it later, and did. She wasn't willing to talk about it and asked me to wait till we were home to discuss it. I agreed as I loved her deeply and thought we could work through anything. Her mother was an older version of her. Same stunning looks, just a few grays in her long, thick blonde hair. This is important later. Back home, I asked her about it and she was unwilling to discuss it. When pressed on it for a week, she finally confessed that a guy at her work was trying to get to know her better. She wanted to be forthcoming, so she showed me her phone and as I looked through it, I noticed all the texts that would have happened during the time she was withdrawing from me were removed. There was nothing untoward in the texts. But I did go into her phone settings and turned on our locator on her phone as we shared the same phone plan. And I honestly thought it would make me see that she was not doing anything wrong. Was I wrong? That second weekend after Thanksgiving, she had a company Christmas party. I had planned on going but came down with food poisoning and had to back out. She had a girlfriend pick her out from her apartment as they planned on drinking a lot and had a designated driver for the evening. We'd planned on going out all night. So I told her to have a blast and I would see her in the morning. So as I'm puking my guts out and barely able to get off the toilet for more than 30 minutes, I grab my phone and watch her location. First it was the restaurant, then the venue of the company party, then a bar. None of this alarmed me until I saw her phone stop in a downtown hotel. At this point, I was miserable in more ways than three. Projectile vomiting out my butt, mouth, and now soul. I finally fell asleep due to sheer exhaustion at 2 a.m. At 7 a.m., I awoke and saw she was still at the hotel. At noon, she finally comes home and I'm on the mend. She loves me up and I asked her about the previous night without mentioning anything about knowing her locations. She talks about the restaurant, party, the bar, but then says she wants to her girlfriend's house to crash for the evening. First lie. For the next three months, she has to start working later and later, three to four days a week. 
As I start asking her about it, she becomes more and more defensive. I talked to her mom one evening when fiancé didn't come home until late. I asked her mom about the Thanksgiving conversation and she admitted to me that she thought her daughter might be stepping out of our relationship because of how she read her body language. She also said that her daughter was being more and more distant with her in their weekly texting conversations. With all this speculation that was going on in my mind, I kept it to myself. Two weeks later at work, I ended up getting a new project at my company that was going to require me to fly to the Midwest Monday through Friday for the next five weeks, starting in two weeks. It came with an increase in salary, and as I broke the news to my fiancé, she was delighted for me. I didn't think though that she was excited for the same reasons I was, so I went online and ordered four motion-activated spy cameras for my apartment. I put one in my living room and entry area, one in the kitchen, one in our bedroom, and one looking down our hallway. They were very small and connected to the internet via a hidden network, so they couldn't be spotted on the Wi-Fi network. I secured the cams with a password and waited. On my first week out, she had girlfriends over the first two nights and never worked late once. The third night, a guy came over. I was enraged. I'm sitting there in my hotel room screaming at the monitor and calling her every name in the book. Then they went all the way, first on the couch, then in our bed. She bent ways for him that I didn't know were possible. What was the worst was as I'm watching them get it on, I call her to see how her day went. She hears her phone ringing and holds her hand up for him to stop giving her back door and answers the call. I ask why she's breathing heavy and she says she was at the gym working out. As soon as the call's over, she goes right back to doing the dirty. When I got home Friday evening, I ignored her and went right to bed. An early Saturday, got up and went cycling. I was so upset that I didn't even realize that I biked over 50 miles from our apartment. The furthest I'd biked before was 30 miles, but that day I went 105.6. Getting back absolutely exhausted, I showered. Then she and I went out that evening and had our fun with our friends and had a lot to drink. Is it breakup sex when the one you're going to break up with is oblivious? I was bursting inside. Heartbreak, anger, rage, feelings of betrayal all swirled around in my heart and mind. She, who used to be so attentive, was oblivious to all this. It hurt so much because I loved her so much. I finally confided in one of our mutual friends and he told me that they all knew about it for months. I was finally told. They all felt sorry for me, but no one again said a darn thing to me, which is why they stopped inviting us out with them. I hadn't noticed it before but I could look back and see that about three months prior, they gradually invited us, or me, less and less. So I figured I would try and win her back. The next weekend, I planned the entire weekend as a complete weekend of spoiling her in every way. Wined and dined, pampering, massages, rubs, talking to her about future plans and about how much I loved her. I knew I was starting to break through when after her fourth glass of wine, she started to cry and I could tell the guilt was coming up to the surface. I asked her what was wrong, but she would choke up every time she tried to speak. I then told her that if she did something in her past or was having some kind of conflict in her mind that she needed to speak to me about, that I was more than willing to talk with her about it, and if forgiveness was needed, then I was more than willing to forgive and move on. The only words that came out of her mouth was how much she loved me. It actually hurt to hear that from her, as I now had four separate videos of her and the other guy in our apartment getting it on. Over the next eight weeks of traveling to the Midwest, the trips lasted for what would be 10 weeks, I recorded over 41 hours of her hooking up with what I found out was her co-worker. She never worked late once while I was gone. I tried every weekend to be extra attentive, and each week she got more and more distant. After watching this for 8 weeks, I was done, so I devised a 12-step getaway plan. 1. Gather evidence. 2. Get her out of the way in order to execute my plan. I scheduled a 2-week exclusive getaway trip for us at an all-inclusive resort in Barbados. She was ecstatic. Then a week before the trip, I claimed I had to back out and told her to take a friend. I knew it was over when she showed no disappointment that I couldn't go. She scheduled co-worker to go with her. 3. Terminate our apartment lease. It would expire 3 days into her trip, and I was the sole signature on the lease. 4. Find a job in another town. 
The company I'd been assisting in the Midwest had offered me a job with a slight increase in salary. 5. Find a new place to live. I got an apartment in the above said location. When she's gone, perform the following. 1. Take her to the airport. Go back home. Pack all of her things the same day. Saturday. 2. Get a new phone number, phone and email. Cancel all social media on Monday. 3. Separate us completely in regard to finances. Withdrew all monies from our joint accounts and then closed them. I put all her money in an envelope and packed it in her things Monday. 4. Have the movers pack all my things up and ship it west Monday. 5. Take all their things to her mother's house 600 miles away. All my fiancé's belongings fit into the back and bed of my F-250 crew cab Tuesday through Saturday. 6. Give her mother the evidence. 7. Start my new life. I didn't want to do anything that was illegal, so I made sure that nothing of hers was missing. It was so hard to pack all her stuff up nicely and neatly away. I never cried so hard in my life. I've read so many times on Reddit about significant others saying they'd never do it again when caught, but they didn't stop. My hope was that she would genuinely confess so we could forgive and move on. She never did. Twice, she came really close. But her secret was too hard for her to reveal. Tuesday morning, I left our apartment north of DC for the last time. It took 10 hours to get to her mom's house. What happened when I got there? I was not prepared for. I arrived at her mom's house around 8 in the evening. I figured she would be surprised to see me since I was coming down unannounced. Since they lived in a gated community, I had to buzz her house from the front gate, so she was waiting for me outside when I drove up. I could tell that she'd been crying when I walked up to see her. I asked her what was wrong, and she hugged me bawling that she thought her husband was cheating on her with a much younger, skinnier, and prettier woman. Dumbfounded, I just told her for what was probably 10 minutes. She soaked my right shoulder with her tears and snot. When she finally composed herself, I asked if we could go in and talk. We went in and I asked where her husband was and she indicated that he was going fishing with his buddies at a remote cabin an hour away. Then she said, he hates fishing. She gave me all the indications that she'd picked up on and apparently it had been going on for about a year. So, doing a little bit of research, we found a credit card hold charge for a 5 star hotel that was only 20 minutes away. One call later confirmed her husband was in fact there for a 4 night stay cheating with his mistress. Two peas in a pod, I said. What? She responded. Two peas in a pod, I said again. Your husband's cheating on you, and your daughter is cheating on me. That's why I came here to drop her stuff on and move on to so-and-so. I showed her the evidence in a binder on screen captures I'd made. After looking at the first three or four pages, she looked at me dumbfounded. We both hugged and cried for a good 30 minutes. At that point, she said stop crying and looked at me and said... Well, tonight there's nothing we can do about it except for you and I to knock out these bottles of Moscato and hook up in every room of the house. She grabbed two wine glasses and a bottle of Moscato wine and walked out to their private pool deck saying, are you coming out here or are you going to get freaking revenge? No, I won't go into too much detail because I don't want to get blue balls, but that night and for the next three days, we hooked up non-stop everywhere she could offer, in or on 25 plus times in that period. After those days were over, we passionately said goodbye and I drove to my new destination. She kept me informed as to everything that happened when now ex-fiancé got back. The day fiancé got back was epic. I cancelled my phone the morning of the day she got back. So when the plane landed and she called for a ride, it indicated the phone was disconnected. She apparently had her lover take her home, he dropped her off and left. When she came to the door, a strange couple, new tenants, answered the door, and she freaked out. I can't tell you how many times she tried to call me again, because the number was no longer valid. She went to her girlfriend's to stay for a time, as co-worker was already married. When she called her mom in a panic, her mom told her that I had come down and dropped off all her things, and mentioned that all her monies were down there as well, 600 miles away. Her mom didn't tell her that she'd hooked up with me more than three days than fiancé and I had in the last six months, but she did tell her that she knew that she was cheating on me, and I said I'd found a nice new job, a place to stay, and a new career far away from her and all the friends we had, and that her mother was separating from her father due to infidelity. Apparently she cried for days and took a week off work, 
but alas, she found comfort in the arms of her married lover. Her mom never let her know where I was at. I completely cut off that part of my life. The only link I had to that old life was fiancé's mom, and she kept our secret to this day. Fiancé was ghosted the mosted. I mean, if there was ever a time to get a double revenge, I suppose that's it. I will say this thing is definitely nuclear. If you were given the exact opportunity OP was here, would you just drop her stuff off and leave to never return? Or would the chance of getting that harsh level of revenge with their own parents be too much of a life story to pass up on? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. No proof? No problem? Don't mess with woman's best friend. I manage a bar, and one day I came in to see the place totally ransacked. Thankfully, but weirdly, nothing was stolen, which meant it was someone with a personal vendetta. I'd recently fired an employee who I suspected had done it. We hadn't been able to get his keys back yet, so he had a way to get in, and he knew the alarm code since he would open the bar sometimes. I went to my office and saw that the lock on the door had been smashed in and the CCTV footage was deleted. The only thing that was missing was a clay mold of my dog's paw print I had taken right before she passed away. This dog was my first pet and was my best friend. I always talked about her and had brought her into the bar a couple of times on my days off. We let pets stay on the patio, so all the employees knew how much she meant to me. I kept the mold on my desk to always have her with me. I was sure it was him. He hadn't taken his firing so well, but with no absolute proof, I couldn't just outright accuse him. The bar's a bikini bar, and the dude was a total creep. On multiple occasions, he had made disgusting comments to the girls. The cherry on top was when he came in drunk and assaulted the girl working. Men who came in could be gross, but the things he would say and did were on another level altogether. When I called all the employees to ask where they'd been, he totally outed himself before I could even ask. He said, I was home with my wife on Saturday night. I just smiled into the phone and said, I never said it happened on Saturday. He quickly hung up. Gotcha, witch. The police couldn't do crap though with the camera footage deleted. All I had was him knowing it happened on a Saturday. Plus, the damage wasn't too bad, just a lot of smashed plates in the lock on the door. So there wouldn't be much to sue him for if I did get proof. So I decided to get even and get my dog's paw print back. He only deleted the night of the break-in, not the rest of the footage. So I combed through hours of footage to find the time he slapped the girl's butt and grabbed at her chest. But I found something even better. On the camera pointing to the back alley, he was screwing some chick, probably a prostitute, definitely not his wife, up against a car. Jesus, this dude was an idiot. He even smiled and waved at the camera. I copied the footage to a USB stick and put it in an envelope. I knew he had another job, so I waited there until he showed up and went inside. I stuck the envelope under his windshield wiper with a note. It read, give back what you stole or this will start popping up everywhere you go. It didn't take long for him to text me. I played dumb and acted like I knew nothing about it, but added, sounds like whatever you took was important to the person. He told me to freak off and said he didn't have whatever I thought he took. I still played dumb. The next day, I left another USB in his mailbox. I knew his address from his W-2 and another on his windshield wiper again for good measure. I guess he found both of them because I received another string of texts asking what the freak is wrong with me. I still played dumb but told him to give back whatever the person was asking for and it would probably stop. He said he didn't have the paw print and was going to the police. Man, this guy was as dumb as a bag of rocks. I told him only I knew the paw print was taken and now I had the proof he broke in for the police no response. I'm no lawyer, but pretty sure what I was doing was just as illegal as him breaking in, if not worse. And he would have had a good case on his hands for blackmail, but he was dumb and probably just wanted it all to go away. Safe to say, the next day, one of my bartenders told me that the guy that was fired dropped off his keys and a package for me. In the package was my paw print broken in half with a letter that basically said he was sorry and he didn't mean to break it and was just pissed off he got fired and to please stop leaving the video. I debated for a good while if I should send the video to his wife anyways, but I found out she was divorcing him because she had found the one in the mailbox. Now I'm not saying what OP did here was the right thing, but as a dog lover who actually does relate 
pretty greatly to this story. I have a paw print of my childhood dog too. I'm not saying what they did was right, but I understand. Do you guys agree that it's understandable why OP did what they did? Let me know if you guys agree in the comments down below. Our next story is by an anonymous poster. Cost me money? It'll cost your life. Two disclaimers. One, no one died. Two, I'm not the subject of this story, rather someone else is. So, I'm a race car driver. Well, getting back into it after a horrible accident a few years ago, but that's besides the point. And I race mostly vintage stock cars, i.e. Oldsmobile, AMC, Hearst, we're talking late 60s, early 90s. Now, for those who know a bit about these cars, their moment of inertia along the roll axis, in reference to the pitch yaw roll concept, is incredibly small. So they flip easily if they spin, and they like to flip rapidly. So there's this one kid, I think late teens, who's fairly rich. It wasn't that he was a bad kid, but he certainly didn't shy away from getting physical. Granted, this is a local track stuff, so beating and banging is expected. But this guy will shove you into the wall, and you better believe getting your alignment screwed up and not being able to steer because someone wanted to pull a slide job on you will leave a sour taste. One night, a few years ago, we were geared up for a 3 8 mile dirt track. Speeds typically range from 50 miles an hour on corner apex, the slowest part of the turn, and 110 miles per hour on the braking zones. Well, at the beginning, I'm sure the speed tapers off further along in the run as tires wear out. I'm behind said kid and another driver who's notorious for being a hothead. Again, he isn't a bad dude either, but he was a fight on Sunday, beer on Monday kind of guy. He didn't hold on to things, but he gets pissed easily. I don't really remember how far into the event we were, but I was trailing these two for a few laps. The kid was trailing right behind Hothead and presumably tapping on his bumper a bit. This is typical short track racing. It took a while, but the kid finally caught the inside corner panel of Hothead and was able to stick his car into the inside, and essentially ran side by side with Hothead for a few laps. They were bumping doors a bit, the kid was trying to take momentum off of Hothead and pull away, but he could never really clear him. Hothead had a real good weight balance from what I can remember when racing with him in other events, so he's difficult to move around and pass. Eventually, the kid gets tired of being door to door, so coming out of one of the turns, he very flagrantly slams Hothead into the wall, which, while not necessarily illegal in this league, it's definitely a big no-no among drivers unless you're looking to fight. And here's the revenge. I don't think Hothead's car was damaged too terribly much, but he had to be steaming. The yellow flag was thrown, and as the field was slowing down, I remember him zooming right past me to catch up with the kid and give him a solid smack in his bumper before getting to the outside panel and spinning him out. As I mentioned earlier, these things are easy to flip over and flip quickly once they're sideways. So of course, the kid starts going into a supercharged barrel roll. The car kept flipping and flipping until finally the roof of the car hit the catch fence. But not just any part of the fencing. You see, small tracks use advertisement on steel beams right behind the catch fence to help earn some revenue to keep the place going mostly in corners so audience view isn't obstructed. Well, when the kid hit the fence roof first, he hit the solid steel beam behind it as well, completely crushing the survivor cell of the car where he was sitting. I'm not one to be super pessimistic, especially in a race, but being right up close to when it happened, I knew the kid was in trouble. I could see the lights just out of the corner of my eyes of the track safety workers running out to help him. And when they red flagged us, all I could see was out of my tiny little mirror just sticking out of the window. The workers were going into overdrive mode and trying to extract him out of the car, which usually means the driver's in critical or life-threatening condition. So, the aftermath, the kid ended up being in critical condition with a compressed neck, broken jaw, a nearly severed tongue, I assume from his teeth going right into it and biting down on impact, concussion, severe internal bleeding, spinal contusion, and a herniated disc. This was all described in the local paper the next day. I don't think I ever saw him race again, nor do I really know what he's up to now. I did feel a bit bad for him as a person considering the amount of injury, but as a driver, I couldn't as much as if I were that upset, I'd probably spin him out too. I don't think Hothead had intended for him to be as injured as he did. As for Hothead, he was black flagged and parked for the race and from the track for about a year, I think. 
From what I can remember, he wasn't charged with anything. However, he was fined by the track and by the kid's family, understandably so. Again, as a person, I shook my head at him for what happened. But as a driver, I know I would have done the same if I were that angry. And like I said, you can never really predict the consequences of what happens. There's a lesson for all of this, and it's important for those who want to get into racing. This isn't a sport where your body's in total control and you can lay waste to your opponent if you want. These are incredibly fast, 4,000 pound machines that can and will hurt, injure, or even kill others if you're not careful. The best way to avoid situations like these is to keep a very calm and collected head. Which, trust me, it's going to be pretty hard. And to maintain a level of mutual respect as not just a competitor, but as someone who's so easily at risk of getting a life-changing injury from one person's decision. Watching races and seeing races and drivers and the skills they possess, they're really amazing. And it's such a weird thing because I've heard of people who watch it hoping for dramatics like this. But like, it's such a dangerous thing and almost gives me anxiety watching some of them, especially like Formula One. Not just how often accidents can happen, but like how easy it is for cars like that to just completely annihilate. Thankfully nowadays they're getting things like the Halo, which is like a super reinforced beam right over the head of the drivers. But I definitely agree, racing is not a sport to downplay. And our final story of the day is by Schmeggy, Nobody Screws With My Dog. This took place way back in the 6th grade towards the end of the year. I live on the same street as this kid, I'll call Dan. I have a dog that's about 7 years old and loves being outside to play with the neighbor kids during warm weather when everyone is out. Well, on some random day of the year, Dan must have been feeling edgy because he came out of his house and just hit the crap out of my dog with a plastic bat right in front of my sister. She ran into the house, bawling, telling us what just happened. We ran outside and picked up our dog and rushed him to the vet. After not too long of a wait, the vet came and told us that our dog was alive and that he should recover over the next week or two. Now, my parents were angry and they took this to Dan's parents, explaining what he did to our dog. They seemed to be understanding of the situation and told us they were sorry and that they'll punish Dan severely. But I was immensely furious. This didn't satisfy my anger towards Dan at all. Now, here's the deal. I never really liked Dan. He was pretty jerkish at school. We were both in the same grade, but not necessarily towards me, but towards my close friends. And I guess I've been ignoring it for far too long. We were in the same grade, and something the school does every year for the 6th graders is to have a big science fair towards the end of the year, and everybody tries to make these super elaborate projects. This is where I start my master plan. Once everyone was getting close to finishing their projects, I look around the classroom to try and locate Dan's project. His is along the lines of some sort of aerodynamic rocket that travels really fast down a clothesline in a small amount of time. Perfect. I checked out the rocket and the rocket has a fuse. Too perfect. That night, I go home and look at my firework inventory I had left over from last year's 4th of July. Sure enough, I still had a huge belt of firecrackers left. So I went over my plan on what to do. After school the next day, I dissected Dan's rocket and put in as many firecrackers as I could and made sure that they would be set off once the fuse was lit. I put everything back together as if no one had touched it at all. Skip ahead a few weeks and it's the day of the science fair. It took place in our gym and we were supposed to be next to our projects all morning as judges came around to judge them. So, from my point of view, I couldn't see where Dan was presenting, but I paid close attention to every noise in the gym. About a half an hour into the science fair, I heard an enormous explosion from one end of the gym and a loud crash. The blast was stronger than I thought. The rocket was obliterated along with Dan's hearing. One of the beams that held the clothesline fell over and broke some glass on some other poor kid's project. There was a lot of shouting and all of the adults rushed over to that end of the gym to see what had happened. I stood perfectly still. I just sat there giggling at my handiwork, knowing how traumatized Dan must be. 
I felt no sympathy, only villainous satisfaction. I'm sorry, but this kid beat up a dog with a bat and the parents go, oh sorry, we'll punish him severely. This kid is going to grow up to be like some sociopathic, psychopathic, I don't know, something. He's either on the path to be the next Ted Bundy or Dexter Morgan, and I don't know which. My mother destroyed my childhood, made me fail out of college, and laughed when I was homeless. I destroyed her entire freaking life. After almost 25 years of violent abuse by my mother, I finally got the kind of revenge I've always dreamed about as a kid going through the worst of it, but it didn't make me feel the way I expected. For those who aren't aware of my life, I'll try to summarize it all, but it's not something that's easily put into a short paragraph or two. Growing up with my mother was worse than heck. If you've ever wondered what it would be like if your worst enemy went back in time to raise you, you'd understand my life. At some point around 9 or 10, I began to realize how alone I was and how exhausting my life would turn out to be. I kept hoping this time she'd finally just continue wailing on me, hoping she'd never just stop and finish the job. Either that or I'd be so close to death she'd be forced to take me to the hospital where they would question her and I'd somehow be saved. It seemed like nobody ever cared enough to look deeper, dislocated my shoulder with a cast iron pipe hurting me every night until I ate things I was slightly allergic to and then hurting me more for throwing it up, lit my Christmas presents I got then having to be held back by her boyfriend at the time because she was holding a knife telling me for the millionth time that I was worth less than my father and nobody else would care if she did it. I could feel pages with all the things she did to me. I remember when she really started digging in and telling me I was worthless nearly every day. I was 13 and it was the first time I started contemplating ending things, though I was always too weak to follow through. My mother tried to dispatch me three or four times if you count a half-hearted poisoning. I say half-hearted only because I vaguely remember the details, but it involved her forcing me to drink something with bleach in it. It's kind of funny in a sick way because I didn't even remember that until now and that's not as bad as all the things I've put a lot of effort into not remembering. I just have a crappy memory, so I guess it helps. I don't think I've actually went longer than a few weeks without getting hurt, bloody, over something trivial, like not washing dishes fast enough or walking away too hard after just getting hurt by her. Years of physical and psychological attacks. Did I call the cops? Of course I did. Can you imagine how hard it was to watch my mother smile and lie to the cops, telling them I was exaggerating? then having to watch them get into their cars and drive away, knowing I had to go back inside. In the beginning, I had hopes things would change. Towards my teen years, I started drinking and stopped caring, and now here I am, after all of it, somehow still alive. My stepdad used to tell me years after his divorce with my mother that he only stayed with her because he was afraid she'd kill me one day. He's lucky he never saw how much worse it got when he wasn't there to take the hits from me anymore. It would break his heart. He was also the one who told me about my mother being abused while growing up in a different country, which helped me gain some perspective in my teens. Not that it made a difference by then. It didn't matter to me because each and every day she had a choice every time, and she'd choose to hurt me every time. Maybe I'm overstating things considering she didn't actually get rid of me, even though she's come close so many times. Maybe that means deep down she secretly cared about me or something? I don't know. I don't think about it. She did go out of her way to buy me new electronics often, but she'd end up using those as leverage against me and invading my privacy constantly so it ultimately wasn't that much of anything. After everything and all the time she kicked me out from 13 to 17 years old, I was always on edge. She told me when I was 18 while I was staying with my aunt that if I went to college, I'd always have a place to live. I don't know why I believed her. I had went to go stay with my aunt temporarily for four to six months after my mother kicked me out of the house at 17, but my mother would always stop by and buy groceries for me or leave me cash. She was unnaturally kind to me while I was there. By this point she wasn't hurting me anymore, not that she could as I'd have snapped and absolutely wrecked her crap at that age, but I strongly dislike hurting people in any form so the point is moot, and was more so prone to just verbal attacks. But since I was never really around her anymore, life seemed to get easier. My mother had learned more than enough ways to mess with me without touching me. It seemed like she hated me more than I hated myself at times. My aunt couldn't have me stay with her anymore, as she really liked her privacy. I'd already been there for a while. 
and I was an emotionally damaged and rebellious teenager she didn't have time to help. So I went back to my mother's house for the last time and started attending community college full time. I didn't really have any desire or passion, I was just an empty husk going through the motions. But I was still trying my best to keep living, even when I didn't feel the will and the hopes that one day I'd feel something different for once. My mother, of course, decided to go back to her old habits. Things like dumping all the trash with dirty diapers, an old food or dirty dishes filled with water on my bed when I was out if I forgot to do them, and sometimes just because she was in a mood. Locking me out in the snow for hours because I didn't respond to a text or something, even if I had class in a few hours. I wasn't even allowed to have keys. She'd pretend not to hear me when I rang the doorbell or knocked for hours. She'd also tell my younger sister to ignore it. I'd eventually end up having to sleep on the steps outside or at a friend's house and get punished for doing it even though I was 18 because it was her house and her rules. It was always non-stop. I had no real direction and I honestly had no plans to exist past 25 years old. Despite literally all of that and then some, I was doing well in school, community college, with a 3.6-ish GPA. I finally left my mother's house for the last time a few days before finals week. I came home from drinking with friends and was met with my mother glaring at me when I rang the bell at 9pm, yelling when I'd move out as soon as I walked in. She followed me to my little closet of a bedroom where I tried to close the door behind me and she half ripped the door off the hinges. I just sat there on my bed and glared at her silently as she kept cursing and screaming questions at me. My mother then walks away and as I'm in the kitchen getting juice, I hear her on the phone calling the cops on me, claiming she was scared I'd murder her or my younger siblings. I just didn't have the energy to deal. This was three days before I failed all of my finals because I couldn't even make it. I was dealing with too much, so I went and grabbed whatever I had and left 15 minutes later. My mother and I only ever really communicated via email after, though it was very rare and it was very businesslike. I'd tell her what I needed and she'd either tell me to freak off or give it to me. It was hard to maintain consistency in my life back then. I was at rock bottom all the time. I didn't care about anything, I drank every day, hung out with the worst kind of people who brought out the worst in me. I bounced between cheap rooms and couches. It was early 2016 when I discovered photography and it completely changed the direction of my life. I didn't hang out with anyone or bother trying to maintain all the pointless relationships. I just dove head first into it. I was able to put the things I didn't understand about myself into perspective. For the first time in my life, I felt something. Not like a feeling per se, just like the sense of possibility. For the first time, I was seriously wondering just what I could be capable of. I had something to look forward to. I felt like if I pushed myself as hard as possible, I'd be good at something and I'd be a good person. And so I isolated myself from nearly everyone I knew and spent every single day learning or practicing or being frustrated that I wasn't getting results. Even though I was drinking heavily, I always held a job and kept doing photo shoots and kept practicing like mad. I eventually got my first apartment and was functional for a year. Did I have my crap together? Heck no, but I was figuring my stuff out. Cue one of the worst days of my life. Me getting robbed while I was blacked out drunk for two months rent and camera gear by a friend, which led to me losing my apartment and job, followed by an email by my mother asking how I'd been. We ended up talking on the phone, and it was civil for like three minutes before I mentioned how hard things have really been for me. She was bragging about some new expensive speaker system she bought, and I, like an idiot, asked her for money, about $100. I told her if I could give my landlord anything, he'd be reasonable and give me time to get more cash together, and I'd be fine. That obviously did not go well at all. It all escalates to her literally laughing and then telling me it was my own fault for being homeless. She also completely denied ever hurting me when I stated I was in the situation because of her. I hung up on her. My thoughts were all over the place, and I felt this intense frustration, more so than anger. Within a few moments, my head cleared, and I decided something as I was sitting in my bedroom five or so minutes after the call. I decided that I was going to completely ruin my mother's freaking life no matter what. And so I did. 
I called CPS on her and informed them of my history of abuse at her hands. I informed them about the dozens upon dozens of old photos I have of myself, all bloody and bruised up. I previously compiled as much evidence as possible in my teens, though I never did anything with it until that point. That sparked a visit which led to an emergency removal of my three younger siblings when they caught my mother punishing my little sister coincidentally when they happened to do a visit. My mother was also arrested but released hours later. I reached out to the job she got years ago with the fake resume she made me write for her and made them aware of her falsehoods. Because of her field, it was promptly looked into and she was fired as well as blacklisted. She lost a nearly 80000 plus salary. I then deleted every email and all of the email accounts I made for her because she never changed the passwords. Afterwards, I deleted the email accounts themselves. Within a few weeks, things were definitely going downhill for her. My youngest sister's dad was engaged to my mother and is now trying to file for sole custody of my little sister who's in CPS custody. I'm sure he wasn't happy finding out what his baby daughter has in store if my mother was given free reign. She missed her court appointments, and I know she hasn't been able to pay her mortgage since last year, as I've heard she had to ask one of her friends for money. Her life has become a creamy, messy, crap symphony, and I was the fecal splattered conductor. It was all going to crap. She went radio silent for months and had a warrant after missing another court date. This was all fall and winter of last year that she was off the grid, so I went on with my life. Early 2019, I get a random call from her and find out she went to her home country months ago after everything went to crap. How she was allowed on a plane? I have no clue. So cue another geyser of BS spewing from my mother's mouth. She's telling me I need to tell CPS she's a good mom and that she's never hurt them or me. It's unbelievable. So I cut her off and I shut her up. I was a little buzzed when she'd called and had always mentally prepared for this moment. I started slowly telling her in graphic detail about all the gross stuff I used to do to her food because screw it. I told her how I used to pee in the pitcher of Lipton iced tea she used to force me to make for her and then not allow me to have. I told her how I'd secretly sabotaged her utensils with my butt cheeks before serving her food. She was quiet at first, but then began cursing me out, though it didn't bother me. I'm on a roll, and I wasn't listening. Her words don't matter to me anymore. She's blaming me for her life turning out so terrible, while fully unaware of how true that statement is in terms of the situation she was currently in. She shuts up long enough for me to get one more word in before hanging up and blocking her number. I thought that was the end of it. I expected my last post to be my final update, but as I've said before, My life is a poop symphony. My aunt and I recently reconnected about two months ago. Prior to last month, I haven't seen her in years. We met up and had a long conversation about life and everything, and then she admitted that she talks to my mother nearly every day. She had mentioned all the things happening to my mother, but didn't know it was me who started it all. She actually felt really bad for my mother, but my aunt was always a really caring person, so I understand, I guess... I told her I was very uncomfortable with the thought of her talking to me about my mother and asked her not to. My aunt did it anyways. After meeting up with my aunt, I learned through her that my mother was finally coming back to America. She was arriving at the airport in one week. The problem was, my aunt told her that I was going with her, so the three of us could all talk without telling me. I didn't know what the feeling of betrayal really felt like until my aunt told me that. To be honest, as wrong as it sounds, I'd rather my mother just think I died or something. But my aunt kept insisting that I had to give my mother another chance. And I had to learn to be open-minded, and that though she wasn't there all the times my mom did horrible crap to me, she loved us both and wanted us to get along. Like, I'm supposed to just get along with someone who's tried to murder me? Like, my mother's choked me awake for school. If you don't know what it's like to forcefully wake up not being able to breathe and seeing your own mother standing over you at 5am angrily and tightly gripping your throat, count yourself lucky. But as I said at the beginning of this post, I've already resolved myself to being a bad person, and so I lied to one of the only people who was kind to me, and I promised my aunt I'd try to have a heart to heart with my mom and her and talk out the nearly 20 years of abuse. Obviously that was not happening. When we got off the phone, I called the detectives who gave me their number months back in case I heard from my mother. 
I asked them a few leading questions about what would happen if so and so were discovered, and then I made my plan. I wasn't sure if my mother would make it past customs. How she able to travel to a different country with a warrant, I don't know, but if she did, I'd call the police in the bathroom and wait for them to arrive while I sat with my mother. Cue my mother making it past freaking customs because she's my mother. She's a horrible person, but she's good at what she does, which is being horrible. I digress. My mother calls my aunt when she's getting off the plane, and my aunt says she's going to meet her. I told my aunt I'd wait for them in the little Starbucks and then we'd all drive somewhere else. My aunt agreed and went off. I called the detective and told him that my mother was standing a few feet away from me and if they could meet me at our destination we were going to. They told me that was unnecessary and that they'd have officers closer to me come and apprehend her at the airport instead. And so I waited and waited. And then I finally saw them arriving both at the same time. The three to four officers who had convened in those few passing minutes and actively searching around the food court I sat close to. My mother and my aunt walking down the gate towards me. I felt this overwhelming weight in my chest just kind of settling down deeper and deeper into my gut the closer they got and the more the officers searched. What if they stopped looking when my mother arrived? What if my mother somehow got away with this crap again? Countless thoughts, but I just bit them back. I've grown very talented at silencing whatever my inner turmoil of the day happened to be. But my mother and my aunt were animatedly talking as they made their way to where I was sitting. Before they had a chance to say anything, I quickly jumped up and said, I ordered some teas, let me go see if they're ready, which was the first thing I could think of as they were sitting, but it worked and I dashed off, past the cash register, to the Starbucks, and to the outer part of the food court. Looking back, saying I had to go grab some tea probably wasn't the best thing to say, but I digress. I made it a few feet out the door and half jogged over to the officers who were still looking around the food court area. From where they were, they wouldn't have seen us sitting. I walked over and asked them if they'd gotten a call about a woman who had a warrant or something. I mentioned the detective said officers in or near the airport would arrest her. They said they did, and I told them it was my mother. I told them her first name, and they verified her last name. I told them she was sitting right in the Starbucks, waiting for jail, and one of the cops chuckled. Seemed a bit surprised and judgy that I was pointing them right to my mom. I told them I'd go make sure she didn't leave, and they followed behind like 10 to 15 paces. I half jogged back inside and up to the little table where they were sitting. My mother had that half scowl she always wore whenever she looked up at me when I popped up out of nowhere and my aunt began asking me where the drinks were before I cut her off and looked dead at my mother and her scowling face which had quickly turned into confusion when I finished my sentence. Mom, I know we don't get along but I wanted to let you know it's all my fault. Cue my mother starting to ask me with this kind of soft motherly voice, what do you mean it's your fault? Why do you think? But of course I cut her off because there's nothing she hates more than being cut off and I finally have the power in this situation. I said look witch, I want you to know exactly whose fault it is and whose pee you drank when you're sitting in jail wondering why the world did you so wrong. She sputtered something and then slapped the crap out of me. My aunt's jaw dropped. People are watching. The cops saw it happen as well, as only a few seconds had passed from when I walked in. Into handcuffs she goes. Now she's showing her true colors. Cursing and saying all kinds of things you couldn't imagine a mom saying to her kid. Telling me she'd kill me and so on, etc. I calmly walked behind them as long as I could until they took her to some room and held her until the detective arrived. I wasn't there that long though as the lack of thrill of it all kind of got to me and I went home to break a two month sober streak. I was there long enough for my aunt to tell me she was disappointed in me and that she doesn't know if she can forgive me for doing something so spiteful and disgusting to her sister. To be fair, I did it completely out of spite, so she isn't wrong. I've already acknowledged I'm not a good person for what I did. Come to find out, my mother was using my aunt's passport to leave and come back to the country multiple times since she left. That's why they never caught her. Now my aunt has some explaining to do but I wish she didn't have to get caught up in all of this. She's always been kind to me and doesn't deserve it. My mother's facing up to 10 years just for using my aunt's passport alone and a slew of other charges, including one for child endangerment. Her husband left her, her kids were taken from her, her friends have seemingly distanced themselves from her from what I know. After 19 years of abuse, 
I finally get my revenge, and none of the charges have anything to do with me, which is interesting. Did it feel good? No, I felt nothing. Just the rise and fall of the situation, but nothing really concrete. I expected to feel something, not even satisfaction or happiness, but something. Either way, the only thing for me to do is to continue to work towards becoming the person I want to be. She told me constantly that I was worthless and that I'm nothing. I've told myself the same consistently as well in the past. I've decided I'm going to become one of the greatest photographers of my time. And I'm going to push myself as hard as possible to succeed so that anyone else who has ever suffered how I have now have no reason to doubt themselves or their ability to be great one day. As for me right now, I currently live in a homeless shelter. I decided to go to one six months ago after realizing all the drinking and inconsistency was making it hard for me to move forward. I wasn't saving money and was couch hopping from friend's house to friend's house. A few weeks ago, I got a voucher from the government, and sometime in the next two months, I can find a one-bedroom or a studio apartment. I've been aggressively saving my small checks. I've been practicing and working on building better habits, and just being a better photographer. I don't make much right now, and I know many people will say it's a stupid dream, but I know if I put all of the effort into making it work, I can not only be a self-sustaining photographer, but more than that. My situation's embarrassing and it's hard, but I know I won't be here longer than another few months. It's not some dream, it's a plan. I'll also be going back to school in the fall and pursuing photography. As for my siblings, the situation's still a bit dicey and I don't think I'll give an update about that, but they're all doing very well. As far as my mother's concerned, as horrible as she was towards me, the only part of me that even thinks about her on rare occasions hopes she isn't having a horrible time. I don't like knowing people are hurting. I think almost anybody that goes and hears the story surely can't help but just root for OP as far as accomplishing their goals and dreams in the photography field. Do you guys feel motivated to accomplish things like I do after hearing this story? Let me know in the comments down below. Needed to scare away the bullies. Not my story, by my coworkers from an old job. Coworker will be referred to as A. A is from a Spanish-speaking country, and his family moved to Bronx, New York City when he was about 11 years old. Starts middle school shortly after, doesn't speak a word of English. School's obviously hard, but to make things worse, one group of boys has taken it upon themselves to beat A up after school. This happens A's first three days of school, till he finally can't take it anymore. After getting beaten again, he goes home and looks in his father's tool shed for something to defend himself with. The only thing there are some pliers and a hammer, so he takes the hammer. Next day, the bullies come back to beat A. When the first one closes in, he pulls out the hammer and cracks him on the head, putting a small hole in his skull. The other kids and A ran off. A doesn't know what happened to the kid who got hit, but assumes he was fine as no one hunted him down. No one bullied him after that, and most people just stayed away from him in general till he graduated and went to high school. I guess it's kind of sad, but in some environments, the way you survive is just kind of showing that you're going to defend for yourself and fight. Do you guys feel bad for the kid that got hit on the head with the hammer? Or considering they actively bullied and beat up this kid, maybe you don't feel bad for them at all? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. This next story is by Saren Baxter. Cheat on me? Get what you deserve. When I was around 16, I was dating this really cool guy who I met through a friend. At this time, we were both in the closet, so nobody knew that we, in fact, began a relationship. Back then, I was very low in the self-esteem department, and I'm pretty relaxed when it came to dating. One night, I was laying in bed with him since he decided to stay the night. I, unlike him, am a bit of a light sleeper and usually stay up pretty late. I was just about to nod off when my phone notified me of a text. I looked to see it was a mutual friend who I had to admit would be willing to sleep with any man with a pulse. Usually she was the type who'd like to tell her friends about her latest conquests. This time, she had told me how she had slept with my at the time boyfriend. It turned out that he took off work early so he could visit her and they could hook up. This made it worse because he later came to my home and he did the same with me. At first, I was prepared to slap him and kick him out of the house, but I had a better idea. Slipping out of bed, I searched around my dad's tools, finding a half-empty tube of super glue. 
I made my way back upstairs, but making sure that I unplugged his phone before returning to his side. I continued to glue his manhood to the side of his leg before moving to sleep on the couch the remaining night. I was upset, but knew that it would be worth it once he wakes up the next morning. I woke up that afternoon and sat at the table to eat with my unsuspecting parents, enjoying a piece of French toast, when I heard a loud thud from upstairs. I couldn't help but grin as my now ex limped down the stairs, most likely preparing to curse me out for what I'd done. Of course, my parents were at the table, and he didn't want to out himself to anyone, nor would he want to face my father about cheating and sleeping with his only son. He simply grabbed his phone in the attempts to phone one of our friends for a ride to find that the battery was dead before choosing to walk his way home. Long story short, I enjoyed my toast before inviting a couple of friends on what was supposed to be a date. We all had a lot of fun, and I ended up coming out to a couple friends and explained the situation. I later found out that he now has three kids from different women. Honestly, it was probably over the line to do what OP did, but we are in nuclear revenge, and that is a nuclear revenge. I just can't imagine this guy waking up and being like, that doesn't feel right. Our next story is by Unhappy Panda Chew 101 Jerk Uncle Gets Jail Time. Backstory About 12 years ago, I met my uncle for the first time. He introduced himself to me by literally pushing my dad out of the way and telling me that I was a fat little girl and telling me I should lose some weight. As this was a fairly common thing for me to hear, I just brushed it off. My grandma and grandpa lived in Spain, and the house they owned was fairly large and out of the way, and therefore worth a fair amount. A couple of years ago, my grandpa passed away, and as per Spanish law, his property and money would be split between his children my aunt, jerk uncle, my late uncle, and my dad. But none of the money and property could be claimed until all the children were present in court. This left my lovely grandma in a lot of debt. My dad and aunt agreed to sign over their portions to grandma in exchange for all the love and care they received as children. Q jerk uncle refusing to sign over his share or even show up to claim his part. Meaning for a good while, as grandma was left with no money, no claim to her house, and with a lot of health issues that she couldn't sort, she lost her car, her phone, and a good few months in the hospital left her with some issues. She had contracted meningitis which temporarily messed with her memory. I lost my crap with jerk uncle and started studying Spanish law books, getting my aunt to translate what she could, and we didn't tell anyone about our plan. About a year ago, I presented a case to the family lawyer that due to his selfishness and arrogance, grandma got sick, therefore meaning he caused her harm and then he intentionally continued to withhold the money from her, even though he knew she needed it for the hospital. Jerk uncle got ugly at this point and started screaming about how I was trying to get him to go to jail and, I don't care if she dies, I want my money, were the words that followed. Thank you phones for having a record setting. This voice clip was presented to the police, along with proof of him failing to collect his part of the will. What followed suit was a court case with him having to pay all of the money that my grandma lost in medical bills, and he had to pay a large chunk of the debt she was in or else he would face jail time. He didn't pay. He took his son to Disney instead. 18 months, I believe, he got in the end. I definitely can't even begin to say I know anything about the laws in Spain, but if it really goes down like this, they got some nuclear revenge. Our next story is by Omega Fat Mama, D-Bag bullies me, wrecked his daddy's car, got him expelled, and nearly killed him. So a couple of years ago when I was still in high school, there's this guy, let's call him DB, I studied in a private high school so there's quite a lot of spoiled brats. DB always goes around flexing his dad's M5 and made fun of or bullied other students that drive cheaper and older cars. Sometimes he and his gang would go around school car parks and vandalize those cars. It's a private school, so there's only a handful of students driving around cheap secondhand cars. I drive a 12 year old Camry to school. My family's actually pretty well off, but Maintaining a Camry is a lot cheaper than a Mercedes and that's the reason that I actually executed this revenge. Because I'm the only guy that drives cheap cars and DB's classmate, I took the bunt of DB's bullying. 
Many times after school, I literally saw him and his gang scratching my car and kicking it. Not that I care, it's a Camry. He'll break a leg before he does damage to my car. But soon after that, they started to break my side mirror and even let out air from one of my tires. I tried complaining to school, but the teachers hardly did anything. Only gave him a warning? So that's why I decided to take things into my own hands. Besides DB's debaggery in school, he drives like a jerk on the road too, regularly tailgating and brake checking other people, especially students from our school. The police are really nice here, as in you can legit bribe every single one of them to let you go for a small offense. So DB didn't even once get in trouble. Start of revenge. My revenge was actually very simple intentionally ram his car when he brake checked me so I won't be in trouble. One of my classmates invited everyone in our class to her birthday party. A month before that, I bugged my parents to install a dash cam in my car. Then at the party, I refused to drink any alcohol, saying that I'm not feeling well. DB, however, literally did a whole row of shots within five minutes of arrival, which is good for my revenge. So after the party ended, I followed DB on the road, We live in the same community and it's a 40 minute drive from the party. We're on the highway going 150 kilometers an hour. It's almost 4 a.m. so the road is empty. DB was speeding in the fast lane, as usual, and suddenly he switched lanes. I was getting excited because I thought my revenge isn't going to work. DB drove in front of me and hit the brake quite hard. Then I didn't even let go of the gas only try to ram his car's corner to make him hit the beams on the side of the road. On the dash cam, it'll look like I tried to avoid hitting him, but here's where it went wrong. His car lost traction and hit an overpass support. It looked like melted butter. I got legit scared and stopped my car and ran over to him. The car was smoking and all the airbags were blown. The passenger, DB's friend who's also a jerk, luckily didn't suffer any serious injury. DB, on the other hand, bit his tongue and was bleeding out, and passed out. I remember seeing blood coming out of his mouth like a faucet. I called 911 and the ambulance arrived in 10 minutes. Apparently his condition was very serious then. After DB and his friend got carried away in an ambulance, the police did an alcohol and drug test on me and I was clean. I told them what happened, they wrote down everything I said, and my parents drove me home. I didn't really get in any trouble other than my parents didn't let me go out late for a year. Then later, I found out that DB's license got revoked, got expelled from school, and just last week, I heard from a friend that he was disowned and jailed for drug trafficking. I was definitely gonna say, even if they're driving like a jerk and brake checking, if you hit them, wouldn't you still be at fault? In this case though, OP was talking about how they were swerving from lane to lane, and on the dash cam it looked like OP tried to avoid hitting them. It worked out almost a little too well. It's surprising that somebody would try to brake check by like swerving into their lane and then doing a brake check, but I guess it would be probably pretty effective. Our next story is by Rapid Raptor. Beware the fury of a patient man. I came out as bisexual to my father when I was in middle school. My father was always verbally abusive and an alcoholic due to his own turbulent childhood and his experience in the Gulf War, but after that, it escalated to physical violence against myself and my mother. It lasted up until my third year of college. I was unable to move due to a limited income, and it escalated to full-blown aggravated assault one night that ended with me holding my father on a rear naked choke while the police had to pry me off him. We went to court. My mother filed for divorce immediately, now the revenge. During the hearings, my father was convinced that I was going to vouch for him as though he were blameless. I spelled it out to the attorney and judge. The verbal abuse, the physical abuse, all of it. The look on my piece of crab father's face was priceless, and the final nail was when he blurted out, She turned you against me. Ice water in my veins. I replied, No. You turned me against you. The separation was granted with a vengeance. Not only does my father owe a grand a month in alimony, but my mother now has a restraining order in place. Word got out to my family's friends, and they summarily severed all ties with the old man. 
his social life, his job prospects, his freedom and the life he had built for himself had all been blown to flinders. He still texts me. I don't text him back. As far as I'm concerned, the only time I'll ever see him again is when I have to identify his body. For all the things they did to OP and their mom, with how things turned out you can't help but feel good for OP because the system didn't fail them. This guy was an absolute jerk and did some awful things and they weren't allowed to twist it and use it to their advantage and lie and now they have to pay for it by paying monthly and being cut out of everybody else's lives. And our final story of the day is by Osh9000, Uncle Gets Revenge Against Creepy Neighbor. My parents told me a story that happened several years ago, so buckle up. My aunt was being harassed by a dirty neighbor, he did it for some time, and my uncle couldn't stand it anymore. So one day, he waited in an alley with a baseball bat for him going to work. Once he did, he kicked the door in and smashed everything to bits. The neighbor moved out not long after. Note, it may seem fake, but my parents told me, and it happened a long time ago, so I might have missed some details. I mean, depending on where this took place, and a little bit more back in the day when you could kind of get away with some things, probably a little bit more easily, this guy stalking around, harassing this guy's wife, you kind of understand why they're going to flare up and have a reaction. I don't know if I would wait in the alleyway and take a baseball bat to them, but I would definitely have a reaction too. At least it wasn't actually against the guy and just basically everything he ever owned. I guess if you're gonna break and enter, do it in an era where there's not a lot of security cameras or doorbell cameras or whatever. Nowadays, robbers need time machines to get away with stuff like that. Bully the fat guy? How about you take a stroll? Just wanted to share the story of how I dealt with the bullying around 16 years ago. Little bit of a backstory. I was a bit on the heavy side back then, and by bit, I mean I was the biggest guy in size in school. So I got bullied a lot, mostly verbal. The few times I got physical, I didn't retaliate. So almost everyone knew how much of a softy I am, which made me a prime target for the whole school. Also the school was an all-exclusive boys school. On to the story, I was called a lot of names back then. Chubby, Fatty, Big Lori. Anything big in size gets associated with my name. There's this one guy who I've known since the first grade, let's call him DB, who's been relentlessly bullying me since the first time he laid eyes on me. I'm kind of a nerd, just love computers and anything related to technology, which DB didn't like, because his IQ is mostly a double digit and he has trouble figuring things out. So at the start of 8th grade, we could take an extra class that taught us current technology and stuff. DB stayed at the back of the class and got in a lot of trouble with the teacher because he was disruptive. The technology department's located on the first floor of the school. This will be important later. I'd already complained a lot to the school administration about the bullying and even had my parents involved during the 4th grade. He only got a slap on the wrist because his father was a friend of the school vice principal. Vice Principal had filed numerous reports about DB, but had never taken action. Oh, and the time my parents got involved, he said, Boys will be boys, they're just having fun. They'll grow up and look back to those moments and have a laugh. Who knows, your kid might even lose weight just to impress them. My parents were helpless in the situation. So at the start of 8th grade, the bullying started. And this time it was mostly physical, punching me on the arm, slapping the back of my head. My father had always taught me to turn the other cheek and always to respect others, even if they do something wrong to you. Exactly one month after the start of the school year, I went home with a black eye and fingernail scratches on my face. My father couldn't bear it anymore. That was the day my father gave the best advice that he had given me. Son, you have the size and strength to overcome many things. Next time anyone even thinks of bullying you physically, mess him up bad. You'll never have any trouble with anyone if you stand up and fight back against them. I had been bottling up everything up until that day. My father's words unleashed that rage beautifully. I went back to school the next day and I was fuming. Eight years of pent up rage ready to freaking demolish DB. My first class for that day was technology class. The teacher still hadn't come to class, so we were all just waiting outside. DB saw me and started going on and on about my size. I didn't say anything. The moment he punched on my arm was the breaking point. 
I simply grabbed onto his shoulders and said the words I was waiting to say all day long. This is for all the years of you punching and calling me names. I freaking threw him over the railing from the first floor. He landed on the ground with a sickening thud. What followed was the most girlish scream I had ever heard. The rest of the class had to pick up their jaws from the floor. VP came running to his aid, looked up. He saw me smiling with the biggest grin I ever had during the eight years I spent in that heck. Parents were called and what followed was a crap show. DB's father tried to punch me in the office in front of everyone, principal, vice principal, four head teachers of the school, and the principal of the school board who just happened to be on a visit to the school. My father got in front of him and laid a nice uppercut which dislocated his jaw. Police were called and he was arrested for trying to assault a minor. Vice principal was fired because he had never taken any action against DB even though he knew the whole story. DB had a broken shoulder and broken kneecap which stopped him from playing soccer which he loved. After the whole fiasco was sorted out, my father gave me some new advice. Just punch their lights out. Don't throw them from balconies. I never had any more trouble with bullies. They were scared of me. My next goal was to protect the other kids who were getting bullied. If I saw anyone bullying anybody, I would stand next to the kid and ask what's the problem. They would always apologize and leave. I could proudly say that I solved the bullying problem and our school barehanded. Well, good on OP for finally standing up against these people. Sometimes I like to hearken back to the phrase, violence is never the answer, but sometimes it is. Growing up, have you ever been in a proper fight at school? Let me know in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by used ad 4905 Ex and boyfriend hurt my daughter, tarnish my friend's reputation, and I seek revenge. I'm going to begin with the main players. Me, my ex-wife Pepper, revenge target number one. Her boyfriend Steve, revenge target number two. The boyfriend's ex-wife Maria, co-partner in the revenge. My daughter Sarah, and my friend Jason, accomplice in the revenge. With that said, let's get some backstory out of the way. So, Pepper and I had a very up and down marriage. It was one of those that I was madly in love with her, but looking back, I think she was more in it for the money and convenience. She had one son we'll call Drug because he was and still is a major drug addict before we got married. And I also had one son, name is unimportant, that I had full custody of. While married, we had Sarah. I toughed the marriage out for as long as I could, but eventually we just couldn't keep it together. We separated and due to traveling some for work and having custody of my son, I moved back to my hometown a few states away so my parents could help but kept an apartment in the town that Pepper and Sarah lived in so that I could still spend as much time with my daughter as I could. At this time, I asked my best friend Jason who's a lawyer and owns his own firm to do up a child support agreement for us. It's very important to note that we only address child support. It had nothing about custody or visitation or anything else in it, so for about a year, this is how it would work. I would spend a month with Sarah while my parents watched my other son, and then I would spend a month with my son. Almost exactly a year later, I could no longer afford keeping two households, and Pepper was wanting to move back to her hometown, which was in a different state, but closer to where I lived. So I gave up the apartment, and she moved. The new situation continued for a couple more years. Pepper and I remained friendly and even tried to reconcile the relationship a couple of times, but it wouldn't work out. I was still deeply in love with her, but we couldn't come to an agreement on things like where to live and such. I forced myself to try and move on and started dating. She'd been dating basically from the day after I moved out. Even though I still loved her, our relationship moved more into good friends than husband and wife, so she eventually meets Steve. I never was told much about Steve other than he was a certified ethical hacker and that is what he did for employment, important later. While they were dating, she would send me texts about their dates. She even texted me the day they first had sex together. This hurt deeply and looking back, I think this is what she wanted, but I tried to play the part of good friend and confidant. Steve and Pepper had been dating for 6 months when out of the blue she tells me they broke up and she realized that she's madly in love with me. 
Since it's at the beginning of summer, she packs some suitcases and heads to my state. They were going to spend the summer with me and see if they like it or not. We had an amazing summer. All the kids are getting along. Drug even loved it here. So she makes it official. We're back together. And they're moving in. We went and registered my daughter for school. We were even able to get her on a peewee cheerleading team for the summer. She made several friends and was loving being here. There was only one problem. Pepper still had an apartment that had all of her furniture and stuff in it. I offered to go pick up with my truck and help load everything, but she insisted that her and Drug can get it done. So off they go to pack it up and then head to their new home. As you can guess, things didn't go as planned. She was home for about three days when she informs me that under no circumstance will she move and that her and Steve are in love and moving in with each other. To say I was destroyed was an understatement. I couldn't understand why she had done it. The worst part was that she had left it to me to tell Sarah the bad news. When I told her, the devastated look on her face started turning my feelings of hurt into feelings of anger. Then Sarah broke down and started begging to stay with me and started spilling the beans. She told me things about how her mom would leave with Steve for days and leave Drug in charge. She had to learn how to cook for herself at 8 because Drug would spend the money on, well, drugs and spend the whole time high. If Drug wasn't left in charge, Pepper would use her multiple convicted felon niece to watch her. She also told me about the first time that she had met Steve. He came to their house, basically said hello, and him and her mom disappeared into the bedroom and started having loud sex. Sarah was outside the door and they just ignored and continued. This is how my 8 year old learned of sex and is still in counseling trying to recover 7 years later. At this point, my anger has turned to rage. I immediately notified Pepper that there was no way Sarah was coming back and I would fight her to the death to keep her out of that situation. Pepper responded by getting an emergency hearing in her state to force Sarah back. I had to scramble but I managed to get a lawyer and easily won the hearing, which Pepper showed up late for and told the judge it was due to a disability. The judge agreed that since there was no custody agreement and with the troubling accusations, that it was best for now for Sarah to stay with me. I had won the first battle, but it was short lived. Within an hour of the hearing, I started getting tons of phishing emails and texts. I was also getting password resets and MFA codes for my bank, Facebook, Reddit, and any other accounts. I knew that Steve was behind it. The very next day, Jason calls. His law firm's website, email, and phone account has been hacked. Because he had to disclose the hack to the court, and because he was working on a semi-high profile case at the time, the FBI got involved. To say I was enraged was an understatement. These two people had destroyed me, harmed my daughter, and tarnished the reputation of my lifelong friend. It was time for them to pay and pay dearly. I was a man on a mission. I spent hours digging up as much dirt as I could on Steven and Pepper. I had a lot of luck with Pepper. I found social media posts of her out late drinking that correlated to tardiness and missed days at school for Sarah. I found tons of pics of her and two strange kids doing fun activities. I found neighbors that were willing to testify that Sarah had to come beg for food because she was either left with either drug or the felon. I knew I could bury her. Steve, on the other hand, had all of his accounts locked down. I couldn't find any dirt and it was driving me crazy. Then it hit me. Try LinkedIn. It paid off. There wasn't much posted through his account, but I found his ex-wife's account. I reached out to her, and she happily accepted. Maria and I became fast friends. She hated Pepper, for good reason as they'd both abandon her kids like my daughter, and didn't want her around her kids. I learned so much. To keep it short, Maria and Steve had recently divorced. As part of the custody agreement, Steve got the house, car, bank account, savings, and a lower than usual child support. Maria had traded all that money to have control of the kids. She knew he was a scumbag and all she was concerned about was keeping her kids safe. They had a very detailed custody agreement with rules for Steve to follow. As part of that agreement, if Steve broke any rules, then he had to pay and pay dearly. He had to sell the house and give her half of everything. His child support would also double, 
and Steve would be financially ruined. Steve also didn't have her blocked on the social media and would regularly send texts bragging about how great his life was without her. Many of those texts had pictures of Pepper in them. We compared notes, we swapped evidence, we came up with a plan, and now it is time for revenge. First, I got with Jason. He let the FBI investigator know that I also had some hacking attempts and we believed it was the same person. The investigator called quick. I gave him all the information I had and who I believed was doing it, and he asked a weird question. Do I know where Steve worked? Well, yes, I did, thanks to Maria. So apparently Steve wasn't as good as a hacker as he thought himself to be. They had already tracked back the hack on Jason to a business, the very same business Steve worked for. As soon as my conversation with the FBI was done, I called his work to lodge a complaint. I told the manager that someone was trying to hack me and I was sure it was Steve. They of course didn't take it too seriously cause I had no proof. What they didn't know was that they were soon going to be getting a visit from a special agent. The next week was absolute heck for Steve and Pepper. Pepper got served with divorce papers and her lawyer got served with all the evidence I would gathered. My lawyer said it was the most complete investigation he had ever seen. I had all 40 tardiness and 19 absences tied to nights out drinking with Steve. I had hard proof of them abandoning my daughter for days at a time. Maria even gave me a picture that was taken at 2am the night before the emergency hearing with Steve and Pepper drinking in a tattoo parlor. The same hearing she was late to and said it was due to a disability. Steve got served that he had violated the entire custody agreement. Maria had pictures from me proving he was with Pepper on the nights the kids were with him and they were left alone. She also had proof that there was contact with Pepper that violated the custody agreement. The fallout was awesome to watch. Steve was fired between my complaint, another older complaint of him hacking, and the FBI showing up. They had no choice but to fire him. He did avoid any legal issues as the FBI could never tie it directly to him. The word spread of why he was fired and no one would hire him in an IT job again. He had to sell the house, liquidate all the investments and bank accounts and give half to Maria. His child support got to stay the same since he no longer had a source of income. Last I heard, he was working at a grocery store. So, in total, his income went from 200,000 plus a year to less than 40 grand. As for Pepper, the divorce was swift and painful for her. The judge ruled in my favor for all counts. I got sole custody and sole decision making. She was forced to go to counseling and her and drug can only visit Sarah with a third party supervisor paid for by Pepper. Sarah's doing much better. She still needs counseling, but she thrives in school and has many friends. She very rarely sees her mom, but she's much better off without her. I think it's great that Sarah has such a caring and dedicated and devoted father that they're willing to lay down all this legal in-court stuff just to protect them and make sure that they can stay with them and get the help they need and just foster a good environment for them to grow in. Steal from me? I'll ruin your career. This was about two years ago in college. I had just moved into a house off campus with three of my closest friends. There were two other college guys already living there. All of these guys were doing Air Force ROTC with me. Basically, you go into the military after you graduate. I really liked all of my roommates in the house except for one of the dudes that was already living there. He had a dog that would constantly rip up, pee, poop on the carpet, and he wouldn't clean it up. Furthermore, he would yell at us for leaving dirty dishes in the sink, etc., while he was the one making the vast majority of the mess. I had a job working around 30 hours a week and doing school full-time and doing ROTC. I had a job as a server, so I would make quite a lot of tips, around $300 a week. I would leave the cash in my room boxed up because I trusted everyone in the house. We were all going to join the military and integrity is a big thing. So I go to deposit my tips in the bank after not going for about a month and I'm shocked when my cash deposit is only about $200 when I knew it had to be at least $1,200. I knew someone was stealing my tips then. It then made sense because my deposits had seemed a little low for a while. 
I was furious because I was barely scraping by working my butt off trying to pay for college. So I buy a security camera for my room and hide it. I get all the documents for my work regarding the tips I've made over the past few months. I continue leaving my tips in the box unconcealed as bait. I don't tell any of my roommates this. Sure enough, I leave for a trip and I get a notification on my phone. I watch as this freaker that I trusted steals about $300 in cash from me, taking only $20 bills so I wouldn't notice. Well, the next day back from the trip, I schedule a meeting with our ROTC commander. I bring him all the evidence and video footage and tell him about my awful experiences with him in my house, with my other roommates as witnesses. Long story short, he got kicked out of ROTC and ruined his career. He had to pay me back about $1,000. I let him off easy and had to pay the military back about $9,000. He'd been getting paid by them for about a year. In addition, we go to an expensive school and he chose a useless major. So he stacked high in student debt with no real way out. And finally, he had just quit his job because he thought he could get away with stealing from me and watching TV at home. And he had just crashed his dream car he'd been working on for a while because he drives like an idiot. I still see him every so often on campus and smile at him. So considering this guy was quitting their job, planning on banking off of stealing OP's money and living off of that, do you think having to spend over 10 grand, being stuck with a useless major, their car broken down, getting kicked out of ROTC, do you guys think that's enough payback for what they did? Or do you think it needs to go even further? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by JXXXLZ, Grandma plays the sweet old lady facade and destroyed them all. My boyfriend and I were together for nine years. On our seventh anniversary, he proposed and I said yes. But we decided that we'd get married after two years so that we'd have time to save up enough for the wedding and our future kids, etc. Our families were ecstatic, except for his mother. I don't know why she never liked me since day one, and she was not shy in showing it, i.e. incessantly accusing me of being promiscuous but mainly being a gold digger. I'm not trying to brag, but I earn more than her son, and this will be important later on. I came from a well-off and respected family in our community. Whilst preparing for the wedding, his mom took pleasure in being a gosh darn pain in the butt. Jerk mother would make changes about the details of the wedding without informing me or her precious boy, such as informing my guests that their invitations were revoked to accommodate her chosen guest, whom I've never met or heard about before mess with the seating arrangements, and change the menu and arrangements, etc. I had to pay twice, freaking twice, just to revert the changes she made. Of course, it didn't sit well with her, so being the ever-mature adult that she is, she cried and threw a tantrum. A freaking tantrum! I am not a confrontational person, and I easily get anxious when I feel tension arise. Thank God spineless ex fiancés grandparents, from fiancé's father's side, were really lovely people and of course my beautiful grandma. They were the main reason why I was able to put up with all the BS she was doing. Belittling was one of her hobbies, so it didn't come as surprise when she berated me about my wedding dress, which was gorgeous by the way, and it was handmade by my mom's best friend, who's like my second mother. It took a year and three months to finish the dress. In short, the dress was really, really special to me. I never ever raised my voice, nor said anything negative about jerk mother. But the straw that broke the camel's back was when she stole my wedding dress two months before the wedding and destroyed it because she didn't like the design. I had a full on anxiety attack when I found out what she'd done. And whilst my anxiety attack, she never lifted a finger to help, but she was on her usual routine calling my anxiety attack a cry for attention and that I was just being over dramatic. It was too late to fix the dress, so I ended up buying a new wedding dress. By this time, we were way over the budget for the wedding because of this monster. Wedding day comes, lo and behold, my dashing fiancé was a no-show. No one knew where he was and no one could reach him. I was devastated, a crying mess, and of course, jerk mother thought it was the perfect opportunity to verbally attack and mock me. To be honest, it still hurts me every time I remember this. 
up to this day, I honestly believe nothing will ever make me feel so pathetic. I showed up to work the following day, desperately trying to distract myself from all the fiasco, and three days later, I found out that he'd been cheating on me for a year with a mutual friend. The worst part was that we all worked at the same place. As I said, I am not a confrontational person, so I did my best to avoid them and avoid the drama, but ugly cheating friends started tormenting me by purposely showing off how sweet spineless ex-fiance was, how he treats her like a princess, topped with nauseating public displays of affection, and was spreading rumors and talking crap about me just to get me riled up, but it didn't work. Ugly cheating friend, with the help of jerk mother, started targeting my family. As I mentioned, my family is well respected in our community, and everyone knew what went down between us. So some of our close friends informed us about cheating friends' malicious comments about our family. Of course, my ex-fiance, being the ever spineless witch he is, did nothing and sided with his new side piece. I'm really close with my grandma. She was the one who raised me when both my parents died. I love and respect the woman. She's the epitome of what a classy woman is. She has this aura that was really kind and comforting, but can be very intimidating when the situation calls for it, which is why she's very well respected and well loved in our community. She always had a smile on her face and treated everyone well. And if it wasn't for her, I don't think I would make it after all that that had happened to me. So when cheating friends started bad mouthing her, I was bent on destroying her and my spineless and buttless witch ex fiance. I was beyond furious at this point, thus I started scheming on how I planned to drag them down. I talked to my grandma about it, but she convinced me not to do so and that I should just leave our hometown for a while to take a breather and take some time to heal myself, etc. After weeks and weeks of discussions, and I eventually saw how everything that had happened and currently was happening was taking a toll on my mental and emotional health, I conceded defeat to my grandma's idea. So I left. Didn't contact anyone from the hometown, except my grandma of course. Two years passed, and I received an invitation for our high school reunion. By this time, I've been really missing my friends and family, so I decided that it was high time to return and reconnect with my old friends and family. Everyone was surprised to see me, but everyone was really warm and welcoming. It certainly felt like I was back home. Everything was going well. I was in line to get a refill of my drink when I overheard two girls blabbering about how cheating friend was pregnant and the father of the child was a married man. I was curious as freak but decided not to pry since I no longer wanted to be on the loop about whatever was going on about them. The following day, I met up with my favorite cousin and my curiosity got the best of me, so I asked him about what went on when I left. And oh boy, I was not ready for the tea. My grandma always had a gleeful disposition. She always greeted everyone and engaged in small talks with anyone. But apparently, when I left, she started to act differently. The happy grandma from the next door was gone. She always had a gloomy smile. Even the way she talked changed. She talked about how bad she felt for me, how she was hurting so much that me, her precious granddaughter was going through such a rough time, how it broke her heart knowing that she couldn't do anything to ease my pain. People around us knew grandma as someone who hates to be seen as weak and helpless. Thus, it was truly a heartbreaking surprise when they saw grandma in such a state. Despite her lamenting about my unfortunate situation, she had nothing but kind words for spineless ex-fiance, jerk mother, and cheating friend. Everyone revered me and my grandma for handling the situation ever so gracefully. Their words not mine. Despite all the bad blood, we took the high road. People now started treating spineless ex-fiance and jerk mother differently. They became a social pariah. After hearing what both spineless ex-fiance and jerk mother did and how they treated me, especially jerk mother, most families cut their ties with them. Jerk mother's husband, a good man but very timid, apparently was my grandma's student, filed for divorce and declared that jerk mother could have whatever she wanted for the marriage as long as he doesn't have to deal with her anymore. As for spineless ex-fiance, most of our mutual friends sided with me through the ordeal. He was being groomed to be promoted for a takeover as the department chief and this was huge because if it went through, spineless ex-fiance would be the youngest chief in the company's history. But due to what happened and the fact that his boss, my second mom's husband, was a close family friend of ours, it all went down the drain. 
Spineless ex-fiancé was not fired from his job because the boss thought it would be such an easy way out, and because my grandma spoke to the boss that firing him would be wrong and unprofessional, and again playing her sweet old lady card. Ugly cheating friend was caught having an affair with one of her bosses. Unfortunately, this boss of hers was married, though I found out about the affair but didn't know who the third party was. Obviously, divorce papers were filed, and both parties agreed that it was a no-fault divorce. Until the wife received incriminating evidences of both cheating friend and the boss, which were sent anonymously. Grandma hired a private investigator to collect enough evidence to incriminate both cheating friend and boss. Not only did the wife sue for 80% of their property... She also filed a case to have cheating friend's license revoked on grounds of moral turpitude. As the investigation went on, they found that cheating friend and boss had been stealing from the company. One thing people didn't know about my grandma is that she's really conniving. She knows how to play that sweet lady card all too well. My grandma just told me she saw cheating friend at the grocery store and decided to have a small talk with her. She approached her with a smile on her face and a bottle of olive oil in her left hand. My grandma is a very soft-spoken. With a huge, sickly sweet smile, she proceeded to talk crap about cheating friend. Of course, cheating friend being cheating friend was pissed and started yelling at my grandma. A fellow shopper saw what went on and called the manager and security. When the manager asked about what happened, cheating friend began furiously explaining and repeating what my grandma just said to her. My awesome grandma then put on her gloomy smile and said that, I approached her because I wanted to know if this was the right kind of cooking oil I was looking for. I couldn't read the label since I forgot my glasses at home. I'm sorry miss, I didn't mean to bother you, I just needed some help. And this infuriated cheating friend. The manager turned to cheating friend and said, Ma'am, the old lady just needed some help. And I'm pretty sure she would leave you alone if you just tell her you didn't want to be bothered. My grandma then said, It's alright sir. I was at fault here. Again, I'm sorry miss. I hope you have a lovely day ahead. Everyone who saw the commotion gave cheating friend dirty looks at the grocery store, and some were really sweet and offered to assist and accompany my grandma while doing her groceries. I freaking love this woman. I know I'll never be as cool as she is. My grandma and I would like to thank each and every one of you guys. You're all really lovely, and she'd like to share a little advice. When someone screws you over, let them think that you're an underdog and when they're complacent, hit them where it hurts. Definitely, if you got the face and the persona to pull it off, doing that innocent holier than thou type persona, it can really help you out. If you just reek of that sweetheart older lady look and style and sound, there's probably a darn lot of things you could get away with. Guess it just depends how good your acting skills are. Force me out of the closet, have fun running from the police. At the time the situation peaked, I was 15 years old and a sophomore in high school. Given that this was two years ago, dialogue might be a little hazy, but everything else is true to detail. Backstory, I come from a pretty big family. My dad comes from a family of 15, and my mom comes from a family of 11. Both my parents are the oldest child on their side of the family. Naturally, with that many kids, both my parents took on some parental roles from a young age. My father's the kind of man who's been shaped by his first-hand experiences with poverty. Growing up, he had nothing, and by the time he was 12 years old, it was time to get to work to help feed the other 14 mouths. My dad loved his siblings and did his best to work hard and bring home money so his siblings didn't go hungry. That was a horror he himself faced when he was a little boy. However, this unconditional love sprouted something that was not as innocent. After he came to America, my dad worked his butt off to give his children the best possible life. He didn't want to have anyone face the same things he did. Cue bratty younger siblings. The love my dad has for his kids oftentimes extends to his nieces and nephews. Although my dad's far from rich, he never denies someone who needs a hand. My aunts and uncles knew this. As previously mentioned, my dad comes from a family of 15. Having faced poverty and knowing how hard it was to raise a family that big, you would think my aunts and uncles would know their limits and have smaller, more manageable families, right? Wrong. Some of my aunts and uncles have seven to nine kids. This would be no problem if they went out and worked to provide for their kids, but instead, they sit on their butt at home and look to the big brother for financial help. 
About 8 to 10 years ago, my father landed a job as a semi-truck driver after two years of going to school and studying to be able to get the necessary license and credentials. Everything was going well for my family. Instead of barely making ends meet, suddenly we had some extra cash lying around. This attracted the attention of one of the before mentioned aunts. This aunt had a really bad history in my family and was notorious for being lazy and living off the food stamps and welfare she was given. Here in the States, she has five kids under the age of 12. She constantly throws this detail around with my more well-off relatives, hoping for some handouts. It never really bothered me until everything came to a peak the year I turned 15. The wrongdoings, tax season was coming around and that meant my aunt was in a frenzy. She hadn't worked a day that year, but really wanted to cash in on some of that return money that hardworking people were going to get. Q tax fraud. Since she knows that the government isn't going to give her any money, she sells her kids as dependents for other people to use as tax deductions. Not my kids, not my problem. Tax return season is a fun time for people like my dad who work hard and get to cash in on some money at the end of their working year. This year, he had a plan on how he was going to spend that money. I was going to turn 15 and a coming of age ceremony was scheduled for August. But my aunt had other plans. You see, my dad had this dream of starting his own truck driving business and had been putting it on hold to help family members get out of tough spots. In swoops my aunt. My aunt sat down with my dad and told her all about this plan she had on getting my dad this money and blah blah blah. Her plan fell through and all the money my dad had given her, all the tax returns plus some savings, was gone. The total damage was about $10,000. Might not seem like a lot, but it was almost everything we had. With all this money gone, my dad panics. The money he spent was for the ceremony, and he was running out of time to get his hands on some cash before he had to cancel altogether. This didn't really bother me. I didn't really care if the ceremony occurred. I knew my dad was in a state of stress, and my selfish wants were not at the center of attention right now. But deep down inside, I felt a burning rage towards my aunt. A rage that was not easily hidden. I knew better. I knew that that money was not lost because her plan had failed. She was taking her busload of kids to Las Vegas for a mini vacation and putting a down payment on a way too expensive truck. I knew this was no coincidence. I knew that this money that my dad worked for was being used and paraded on social media at that given moment. But my dad was oblivious. So the rage went from deep down to surface level. I couldn't help the glares or snide remarks, it was just too much to handle. One day, as the whole family sitting in her house talking about the upcoming plans for the ceremony, I feel daggers being thrown at me. I start wiggling on the couch, visibly uncomfortable because my back's to a group of people who are all staring at me and tossing me looks that could kill. I don't muster up the courage to look behind me, but when the television goes dark for a few seconds in between scenes, I see the eyes of my family looking at my back. Some of them look disappointed, others sad, and some straight up furious. I'm scared. I didn't know what I did to ensue this kind of reaction. An hour passes and my parents gather up the family and get in the car. The drive home is silent and my anxiety is shooting through the roof. I get home, drop my stuff in my room, and lay down for a second trying to gather my thoughts. My mom was never the kind of person who just wanted to talk to me and usually left me alone. But she walks in and sits down on my bed looking down. Her eyes wandered as she spoke, but she never looked at me directly. The following conversation ensued. She said, tell me what's going on, please. Me, obviously confused, said, the heck are you on about? She says, your aunt had some things to share about you today. I say, um, okay, and? She says, you know I love you regardless. Why didn't you just tell me? At this point, I'm getting super frustrated because she's not looking at me and she's being super vague about the situation, not addressing anything in particular and just assumed I'm going to admit a crime or something. I say, just tell me what you want or get out. Mom said, OP, I know you're gay. I said, what? I was fuming and felt tears welling up in my eyes. My extended family is very conservative, and being gay was seen as a sin in my family. I'm not gay, I'm bisexual. Regardless, I knew admitting to this was only going to cause trouble for me in the future, so I denied everything to heck. I told my mom to leave me alone and to let me think and gather myself. I sat and I cried. 
I didn't want to out myself yet because I didn't know how to handle my family's reaction, but this decision was made for me. But in that fur of sadness, I thought about who could have possibly found out this information in the first place. Then it hit me. My aunt frequented this local restaurant that was owned by some lady and her husband. Their daughter was one of my classmates and she didn't really like me. Since my aunt frequented this restaurant, she would talk to the daughter while waiting on her meal and brought up that she had a nice niece that was around her age and asked if she knew anything about me. Since I'm more comfortable with my sexuality at school, I'm more open to telling people. Word gets around fast in high school and obviously this information didn't stay in my friend circle for a very long time. This girl my aunt was talking to had found out this detail as well and willingly relayed the information to my aunt. That sadness and that feeling of helplessness soon turned to rage. I knew who was at fault here and her witch butt was sitting at home still living off my dad's tax return. So I made my plan. The revenge, that burning anger soon transformed and became a more calculated anger. I knew what I wanted to do and I knew I had to act on it now. So, as much as it hurt me inside to do it, I put on my innocent 15-year-old girl face and smiled politely when around here from then on. I did so with every family member, acting completely oblivious all while I was carrying out my plan. You see, my aunt's current boyfriend had a habit of smoking weed. Harmless, right? He would post videos of himself smoking weed while holding my youngest cousin. There were videos of him drinking alcohol and giving it to his kids as his idea of a joke. He was a nasty person who dedicated himself to smoking pot and laying around the house all day. I hated him as much as my aunt. I screen recorded videos, screenshot his picture uploads, and even got my hands on some pictures he posted of his huge pot stash. Even a screenshot of him offering to sell this pot to a minor. I gathered this information for about a month, but it wasn't enough to incriminate him. I wanted to incriminate her too. So, I took to some family members' phones. I, being a teenager, am seen as the family's repair woman when it comes to things going wrong with technology. Because of this, I have a lot of my family's passwords for Facebook and other social medias. I never used these passwords for anything bad and just kept them in case I got one of those I can't log in calls. But this time, I used this to get my hands on some information. Within a few minutes of digging and searching, I found information regarding the fact that she knew her boyfriend smoked around her children, how she found it amusing, and her not wanting to take action on this. I also found more information about her selling her dependents for tax returns, and some information on other illegal acts that I will not repeat here. But man oh man was that some evidence. I was sick of it. I was sick of having to smile every time I saw that woman, and I was sick of pretending to be someone that I wasn't. I was sick of this disgusting boyfriend that this woman had and how he would treat my younger cousins. I took all the stuff I collected and I gave it to the police anonymously. The following information was given to me secondhand as I wasn't there when this happened. When the police went to go investigate these claims, my aunt was out shopping and left the kids in care of the boyfriend. Lo and behold, the house smells of weed. The police knock on the door, no answer. My aunt's boyfriend is scared. He's using a towel to try and get the smell out of the house, and he's telling the kids to go hide in their room. He never answers the door, and instead calls my aunt, telling her to rush home. The police give up after a while, since they don't have a court-issued warrant and can't enter the premises without the permission of the resident. My aunt gets home, and her boyfriend is scared out of his mind. As it turns out, he's been doing a lot of illegal stuff. They make their decision. A call is made to my dad asking for money. My aunt packed up her car with all the stuff she could fit in there and was moving across the country to live with her boyfriend's mother. 
My dad gave her the money she asked for, and I haven't seen her since. Last I heard, she and her boyfriend were doing the same dumb stuff. My dad promptly cut off the financial support after he found out from another family member that she was lying to him about using the money for her kids, and instead giving the money to her boyfriend so he could smoke it away. Oh well. One more call to police won't hurt. Once you have a warrant out for your arrest and the cops are looking for you, you can no longer cash in on benefits from the state. So, guess who got their food stamps and welfare checks taken away? Yeah, no more of that sitting on your butt at home money. Another detail, my family and I are all Mexican. Although my family is legal and has gone through the process of gaining residency, Having a criminal record is grounds for getting that residency revoked. So yeah, even though I don't get the satisfaction of her rotting in a prison cell, I do get the satisfaction of knowing she messed up her entire life in the States. Do you guys agree that what this aunt did is absolutely deplorable just to get a little bit more access to money? Lying and cheating and stealing. It makes you wish that OP could just get a hold of their dad, sit them down in a chair and say, Look, dad, you're getting stolen from hand over fist and this person's an awful person. You gotta respect the dad for helping family out where they can, but they had some serious blinders on here. Like to the point that they must have known at least a little bit what was going on and just willfully wanted to and probably convinced themselves that it wasn't. I don't know if it was the weed or whatever that finally convinced them to say, hey, maybe I shouldn't keep giving this money to her to blow for things that aren't actually going to what she says they're going to. I don't know, but you kind of just wish somehow, some way, they would have figured it out and stopped giving that money a lot sooner. If a relative treated you like this, and then after you try to get revenge on them, they move away to the other side of the country, would you still be trying to call the police and report them when you know they can probably get busted for something and still keep up seeking that revenge even though they're not in your life anymore? Let me know in the comments down below. Bully the soft kid and become the guy that got hospitalized by the soft kid. So I wasn't sure whether or not this would count as a nuclear revenge, but I've seen a few stories that are similar. So I thought I'd share mine and hope some of you will get a similar kick out of it that I did. To give context, in this story I'm 12 years old, in year 8 at school in the UK. I was one of the biggest targets for bullying in school for a few reasons. I have a hormonal deficiency which causes rapid weight gain, causing me to be fat the moment I started puberty, which caused endless bullying based on the fact that it's always funny to bully the fat kid. I'm a transgender man, please use he him pronouns if discussing in the comments. But at the time I was living as a girl, which meant I often gave people lesbian vibes, so I dealt with a lot of homophobic bullying as well as sexual harassment. Kids would often find it funny to grab my breasts or butt without consent. At the time, I didn't realize how serious this was, and I'm kind of gutted I didn't proceed legally. I was often called a goody two-shoes as I never got into trouble, always handed work in on time, was in the highest set for all classes, and consistently did well. My family was poor, so I didn't have the best phone, which was a massive status symbol at the time in school, so also got me crap whenever I had to call my family. The icing on the cake? I was a goth at a school in the middle of a chav neighborhood. The school was in the middle of a council estate, and a fair few of the parents didn't really care what their kids were up to. Being a goth wasn't the best fashion choice in terms of eliminating bullying, but I was 12 and I thought it was cool. I'm very happy now, and life has worked out well for me. I'm a happy man, have a beautiful fiancé, a degree from a very prestigious university, and my career is progressing quickly. It has a happy ending, but I was a very miserable adolescent. One such instance of bullying is where everything changed. As I confirmed before, I was 12 years old and I was already someone that was bullied a lot. To make matters worse, my mother had passed away a few months previously so my mental health was really struggling and I was dealing with a lot of deep sadness but also anger during this time. There was also one kid at my school, who I'll call Potter, that had major issues he seemed to take out on everyone else, either by being violent, being disgusting, burping in their faces, or being a pervert, randomly showing explicit stuff he managed to download on his phone at the time, groaning and rubbing his 
his legs while talking about supposed sex he'd had and pretending to have sex in class. If you've seen the in-betweeners, he's J to the extreme. Needless to say, due to the above reasons, I'd quickly become one of his favorite targets. Overall, Potter was, and still is from what I can see via social media, a disgusting human being. Unfortunately for me, Potter was in my tutor group. This meant that every day I had to see him at least twice. Once for morning registration, once for afternoon registration. We had to queue outside the classroom. This was often the time that Potter would strike, as we were often waiting without any teacher supervision nearby. One afternoon, my friends and I had decided to go wait outside our tutor classroom a little early so we wouldn't have to rush back from lunch. We'd been chatting about a recent football game, minding our own business, when Potter came up to my side, throwing the usual insults at me, leaning in close to my face as he said all sorts. At the time, I'd been given two sets of advice when dealing with bullies. One was the same advice that all kids receive, ignore them and tell the teacher. I usually went this route as I'd always wanted to do what was right. Sadly, this rarely worked out, usually consisted of the kid being scolded and then me getting beat up even more for being a G slash grass. The other was advice my dad gave me, hit them and never stop hitting them. My bullying was becoming a real problem for my dad. He had just dealt with the loss of his wife a few months before and was looking after my infant brother on his own. The fact that I often came home bloody, bruised, and in tears, and he couldn't do anything to protect me had a real toll on his stress. So he advised me that the only way to get rid of bullies was to show them you're unwilling to stop, so they know that it's not worth fighting you because you'll do far more damage than they will. As I said previously, I was known for being soft, gentle, and for never daring to break the rules. This meant that one of the reasons I was so easy to target was the fact that I didn't fight back. As I said previously, I originally tried to ignore Potter, continuing talking about football and just pretending that he wasn't even there. This was around 2004 or 2005, and this was during the height of Scooby-Doo's at my school. They were these colored plastic strings that kids would tie in different ways in order to make shapes or key rings or whatever out of them. I never got into it, but they were really popular with everyone else. So Potter took one of these Scooby-Doo's that was unraveled and started whipping me on the arm with it. These were strings of plastic that were quite thin, and he was hitting me relatively hard with them, so each whack caused a painful sting, but nothing I couldn't ignore as I continued talking about football. This continued for almost five minutes before he then went back to queue up in his normal place outside the classroom, and I glanced down at my arm to inspect the damage. Only then I saw the bleeding. Bleeding! I'd been caused to bleed before by being hit in the face, lip getting bloodied against my teeth, or being pushed over and being scraped, but this was the first time that direct contact with something caused me to bleed. The feeling of pure rage that I experienced at the site was one I had not experienced before. Like I said, my mother had passed a few months previously, and on top of the other bullying and puberty in general, I was certainly struggling with my emotions. Only when I saw he had made me bleed did something inside me snap. I forgot the conversation about football, and all I had in my mind was that I wanted to hurt this boy as much as humanly possible. Midway through the conversation, I walked away from my friends, we were on the other side of the room, and made a beeline towards Potter, who was laughing and boasting with his own chav cronies about the damage he had just done to me. I remembered my dad's advice about how to punch if I needed to, to not give any warning, to just do it. I know as a fact that due to my reputation for being a harmless potato, nobody expected me to react the way I did, especially not Potter. Bear in mind, I've always been a lot stronger than I look. Even now I look like a soft, chubby ball, but have shifted furniture easily. I often won arm wrestles to people's surprise and had no problem doing heavy lifting when I was at school, so nobody really expected me to have the strength I did. The moment I was close enough to reach Potter, I pulled my fist back and punched Potter as hard as I could on the side of his head, which forced the other side of his head to collide against the wall besides which we were queuing. Only a second had passed after my first punch, 
in which I saw Potter's mouth fall open in pure and utter shock. Frozen, as he certainly didn't expect any retaliation from me, crap, he seemed to have no idea how to take it. All I remember thinking at that time was, I'm still angry, and I ended up hitting him again, and again, and again. I ended up punching him over and over again, several times as hard as I could against his head, while the other side banged roughly against the wall. After I punched him several times, he still hadn't fought back, still in shock that I was willing to defend myself after he had attacked me. I assumed that my lack of retaliation was probably the main reason he attacked me in the first place, which was most likely why, during my entire attack on him, he made absolutely no attempt to fight back. I had hit his head against the wall a lot, before deciding it wasn't enough damage. Bearing in mind we had arrived early so we wouldn't have to rush back from lunch, there was plenty of time before the teacher would come out and call us into the classroom. I then proceeded to grab Potter's curly brown hair, twisting it in my fingers as he made the most delightful yelp of pain. I then dragged him downwards so his whole body fell to the floor and he was on his back on hard tiled ground. I then proceeded to climb on top of him, straddling his chest and sitting so all my weight was on top of him. I was only 12, but so was he, and as a fat kid, I'm certain he would have been very uncomfortable underneath me. I then pulled back my fist and started to punch him repeatedly square in the face over and over again. It was only on my second punch that I actually felt his nose crack under my knuckles. The first and only time I've actually broken someone's nose, but I didn't let that slow me down by any means. I remember becoming tired and my fist starting to hurt. Towards the end, I was punching him with the side of my fist rather than directly with my knuckles, but I was still going as hard as possible, pure anger and rage influencing me far more than tiredness could. Potter had bullied me relentlessly for over a year at this point. I had to show him I wouldn't stop, so I decided I wouldn't until I was physically pulled away. Sure enough, after a few minutes of non-stop beating, my tutor came out and saw me punching the living daylights out of this lad. She rushed over to pull me off, and without thinking, I leaned back and punched behind me, landing one on her too. At the time, I did feel guilty about hitting the teacher, but now I realize that she did very little to help me when Potter blatantly sexually harassed me, hit me, bullied me loudly in class, so screw it. She then ended up having to call security. The thing is, my school was in the middle of a rough council estate with random acts of violence happening almost daily, to the point that teachers were no longer qualified to deal with the amount that happened. Therefore, we had members of staff that were there purely to deal with violence rather than teach. Police were always at the school too, and it was quite disturbing now that I think about it. After a few minutes, security turned up. It took two fully grown men one holding each of my arms to actually pull me off Potter. By this point, his nose was bleeding greatly, he had a cut on the side of his head, and a massive lump the other side of his head where he'd hit the wall, as well as another lump on the back of his head. He'd been on his backpack when lying on his back, so there was a gap between the back of his head and the floor. Potter then slowly and shakily stood up as I was held back, a panting mess, all of our classmates staring on in stunned silence at what had happened. At this point, our teacher then shouted, What on earth happened? And I heard and saw the most beautiful sound slash vision to this day. Potter sniffed and with tears running down his face, said with a shaky voice, She hit me before breaking down into sobbing tears. I had never seen him at a point where he was that hurt before. Yet after the relentless harassment, Often on a daily basis, I'd received from him. It was the most wonderful thing I could have seen. To know he went from that smirking, smug, violent thug, to sobbing his eyes out while roughly beaten, all because of me, was incredibly rewarding. Potter was then sent to the hospital, while I was sent to isolation to calm down. They seemed to want to make clear to me that I wasn't in trouble, even though I'd beaten the living crap out of this boy. As I had the reputation for being soft, I remember the shock and confusion when I was put into isolation. Another student came in, who was the daughter of a family friend, so we were on good terms, 
and said, what the freak are you doing in here? As she knew I was a harmless nerd, then proceeded to high five me once I told her what happened. Potter was then off school for two days while he recovered from concussion. Apparently he was in real worse for wear after I'd beaten him up and was passing out while in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. When he came back, he kept his distance only then shouting at me that he would punch my nose into my brain from afar when I was going home. I turned around, held out my arms and said, come on then, as he had made it clear how much of a coward he was. His response was to tell me to freak off and go home. He never tried to hit me again. He never tried to hurt me again. He kept his distance all the way up until we left school four years later. I continued to get bullied by various people over the years. However, beating Potter up had made things significantly easier for me, as word got quickly round that anyone that took it too far would seriously get messed up. The best part? Potter had the absolute crap ripped out of him after word quickly got around that he was beaten up by a small, chubby, soft, 12-year-old girl, especially after people saw him sobbing his eyes out and noted that while he would give crap out to many people, he was an utter wimp when they fought back. His nose never did heal back into shape and he always had a nose that slightly moved to the left, I do slightly feel accomplished that his face will never look the same after he messed with me, even all these years later. One thing I just remembered which seems somewhat important, my dad never got told. I sent this kid to the hospital, and at the end of the school day, I was sent home like any other day. No letter, no phone call, nothing. Dad found out from me when I got home, and was proud to have me home after hitting someone, rather than being hit myself. So considering all the events that led up to the incident happening and the outcome after the incident, do you think what OP did here was the right thing? Did they even have any other option besides getting physical like they did? I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Drive long sharp nails into my fence? Kill my vine? Enjoy the weeds my siblings with? This happened in the summer of 1974 when I was 4 years old. When I was a kid, we had a next door neighbor who was a total mega witch. Mega witch was a 40 something woman who liked high heels, mules, big jewelry, lots of makeup, and wore long flowy caftans in garish colors that did not flatter her. She had a big perm, remember it's the 70s, a huge butt, and was notorious in our neighborhood for being an entitled jerk. Her favorite thing was to go onto neighbor's landings, either early in the morning or late at night, and steal decorations and potted plants, which she would then put in her back garden. She even once dug up someone's small tree out of their front yard because, according to the neighbor, she felt it would look better in her garden. Total witch. For the most part, she left my family alone. My family has a take no crap rep in the neighborhood, and she knew it, only glared at me and my siblings when we played outside. She hated kids. Sadly, that didn't last. One day, one of my sisters got badly sliced by a long nail when she went to pick flowers off the passion flower vine on the fence. Important later, turned out Mega Witch had hammered dozens of long nails into our fence so she could hang potted plants she'd most likely stolen. The leaves on the vine had hidden them until my sister got sliced. She had to get a tetanus shot which made her sick all day. Mom was pissed. So she went out and actually spent the rest of the day hammering each and every nail back through the fence and back into Mega Witch's garden, causing many of the pots to fall and break. This is probably why she did what she did. About a month later, my mom goes into our kitchen and sees a man in our yard. She goes out and asks, what the freak are you doing? Guy tells her he was a gardener and had been hired to get rid of the vine on the fence. Mom asked him who hired him to do this. The owner of the fence, he told her, and gestured to Mega Witch's house. Mom told him, calmly since none of this was his fault, that it wasn't Mega Witch's fence and she was the owner. The poor guy was horrified. However, the damage was done. He had already cut into the hardwood and roots and now our vine was dead. After the poor guy left, Mega Witch stiffed him we found out later. Mom went to Mega Witch's house and confronted her. That witch didn't even deny it, just laughed in my mom's face and said, I did it, so what? It's not like you can do anything about it, then sauntered back into her house. She'd just messed with the wrong family. Two days later, Mega Witch went on a two-week vacation with her husband, a jerk, to Cabo. 
Revenge time. The day she left, my older siblings along with a family friend decided Megawitch's back garden needed improvements. So they climbed the fence, went into her garden, dug up all the pretty flowers and small trees, carted them out along with the stolen decorations and replaced them with high pollen weeds, quick growing ivy, and lots and lots of poison oak and poison ivy that they'd carefully dug up from a nearby park. I was too young to help, sadly. We then temporarily moved our three dogs into our backyard. Neighbor was afraid of them despite the fact that they were two Pomeranians and a small mutt. We also had a nine-foot fence, which was too high for her or her husband's fat butts to climb, so we knew our garden would be safe from her. My family excitedly waited. When Mega Witch got back and saw her new and improved garden, she threw the biggest, most epic tantrum and meltdown we'd ever seen. It was spectacular. A whole class of sugared up, pissed off preschoolers couldn't have thrown a bigger tantrum. From the top of the fence, we all watched. Dad took the day off to see the freak out, as he put it, as Mega Witch screamed and ranted, pulled her hair, kicked the weeds, and threw anything she could get her hands on all the while cussing and screeching like she was getting a chili powder enema. Then she spotted all of us watching her. She yelled and cursed at all us laughing kids, coming to the correct conclusion that we'd done this to her precious garden. By this time, all the surrounding neighbors were also watching, but she of course zeroed in on us. Mega Witch then stormed over to our house and banged on our door until mom opened the door. Dad let her deal with it as he was still laughing his butt off. Mega Witch then demanded my family not only pull all those ugly plants out and to, of course, pay for new ones and plant them, and to do it now, right now. Our mom just looked at her, yawned, told her she had zero proof it was her kids who'd done it. My mom knew, even sat and watched with me as my siblings did it, laughing the whole time. I think at one point my dad even helped. Mom then reminded her she had stolen dozens of plants from the neighbors, had been caught blatantly stealing from their front gardens, yet was surprised that someone had retaliated. Mom left, told her to freak off, and went back inside. She ranted at us through the door for about an hour, till her voice blessedly gave out, then stomped back to her house. She avoided us from then on, and would give a death glare to my mom whenever she saw her. Mom would just smile, give her the finger, and go about her business. She was intimidated by my dad, and wouldn't do anything when he was around, but dad worked a lot, so wasn't there most of the time. We donated most of the dug up plants to neighbors she'd stolen from, and return the stolen ornaments and decorations to the rightful owners, if we found them, but kept two rose bushes, which we planted by our back gate, a ceramic hearth cat, which I still have, and a glass and metal sun god decoration nobody claimed. Mega Witch never did get rid of all the weeds, and didn't realize it was poison oak she was pulling barehanded, until she and her husband got horrible rashes over one third of their bodies. And I was told in some very unfortunate places. So with poison ivy, does it travel at all? Or does it have to very specifically come in contact with a very specific body part? I'm just trying to understand how it would end up in some very unfortunate places. If you stole back all these stolen decorations, would you be going around the neighborhood trying to find what belonged to who and return them? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Soupman Bob. I got back at my bully in a big way. I've posted some entitled parent stories, and in one of them, I shared that an entitled mother spread some nasty rumors about me being a violent sociopath that actually managed to stick due to a prior incident. This is said prior incident. This happened 12 years ago and some of the details have been lost to the ages, and some stuff might be exaggerated and or embellished, as stories might get as they get told and retold for years. Now, with the necessary explanations out of the way, on to the story. Strap in, I tend to digress, so this is likely going to be a long one. I was 12 years old, and I wasn't all that tall, I was wide and overweight. I also had one heck of a temper that I had to learn to control in a way so that for the most part, I didn't react violently, but I reacted to most things regardless. It meant bullies loved picking on me. At this point, I'd been bullied for years. It started out with classmates during the lower years until my mom got involved and all the parents were made aware of it and my bullies stopped. 
Then, my first year in the middle grades, 4th to 6th grade, a guy two grades up saw me and immediately realized that I was a prime candidate for him getting to feel better about himself. He was as short as me and a complete geek. This guy started out using an old-timey insult for fat people. I had no clue he was trying to bully me. We had similar interests, so I actually thought he was trying to befriend me. This pissed him off a lot, and he went out of his way to make it clear that he was bullying me. Took me a fair bit of time to actually catch on. Over the years, he escalated, he grew in size, he got a following of friends, and they would use almost every recess every day to follow me and bully me. I'd gone to the teachers multiple times, my mom and dad had contacted the principal multiple times, didn't work. My bullies usually retaliated with getting extra intense and physical too, for a while every time, so I stopped doing it. Snitches get stitches, am I right? Now, my dad was very tired of this happening again and again, so he took me aside and gave me a lesson about defending myself that I shared in my second Entitled Parent story. He basically gave me a rundown on self-defense, told me explicitly never to start a fight, but it was alright to fight back and to end it, that violence should always be my last choice, etc. I took this to heart. This had been going on for two years by now. My mom had contacted the principal again, they were getting physical again, they had cornered me and I tried to get away, they wouldn't let me. I was sick and tired of this. So I looked at them and I said he better stop now or he would regret it. Bully and his posse, of course, laugh. They don't believe a little fatty can do much. At this point, I am seething. I try to get out again. They push me back. And that's when I explode. I jump on main bully. He might be bigger than me, but he's still a skinny geek. I get him on the floor and start wailing on his face. Then when he tries to fight back and push me off, I bite his hand so hard I hear crunching. Meanwhile, his friends are frozen just staring at me. I also jumped on his chest. In the end, it took three teachers to pull me off. This kid had a broken nose, at least two broken ribs, a huge gash on his hand from my bite, which honestly could have killed him, you know, germs and all. I was suspended, duh, for a week, but escaped expulsion because these freakers had tormented me for years and the school had failed to stop them. According to what my dad told me, he had used that defense against the school and promised that if they expelled me, he would expose their failure to stop the bullying for years to the media and all the parents. So yeah, uh, that's the story. And as said, I honestly don't know how much of this is exaggerated, but I got a feeling that the severity of the injuries might be one of the exaggerations. I think this is a good example of why you should just try to treat everybody with as much respect as you can. If you think somebody's weird, maybe they don't talk, and you treat them that way, who knows what they could turn around and do. Maybe an insult was that last turning point for somebody like that, that would lead to such a major unforgettable thing. And our final story of the days by Dutch Wolf Double Zero. Talk racist and kick me? You're half blind now. So about three years ago, I was in high school and there was this guy in my classes that hated me for some reason and I heard he was talking racist about other people. I didn't mind at that time because I didn't want to get in trouble. But when I heard that he was saying that I and my brother need to go back to Africa, I'm black but born in the country where it happened, I was shook. So in the break, I went to him and asked what he said. The conversation went like this. I said, what did you say about me? He said, what do you mean? I said, you were talking racist about me and my brother. He said, I didn't do that at all. I say, I have screenshots of you saying things about me. I could see him getting uncomfortable and angry and he said, if I ever see such a thing again, I'll mess you up. He didn't react to that and he was shook, probably because he didn't know that I would confront him. Then I walk away and get to the next lesson and he pushes me in the back really hard. So I fell and then kicked me on the ground multiple times. What a weak move. Then I stood up shocked and hurt, but I felt so much adrenaline in my body that I punched him on his cheekbone. I did boxing at the time, so it was a hard hit. He ran away and cried. Later, I get called to the principal. He gave me a story that I hit somebody. So I told him the whole story 
and I didn't get in trouble. The next day, I hear that he had some big eye issues because of the punch and that he was blinded in one eye now by me and he got expelled for starting a fight and provoking me. Some sweet revenge. Good on OP in this situation where they're getting hurled some obscenities at them, people are downplaying them, belittling who they are and where they come from. Good on OP for standing up for themselves, breaking this weird mindset that this guy got stuck into, and not only stop at confronting them about it, but keeping on pounding this down into the ground until they got repercussions that they deserved for what they did. Now I ain't saying going blind in one eye is necessarily a thing that this guy deserved, but it'll definitely always be a remembrance. If anyone ever asks what happened, they'll have to think about the time they were being racist. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all three of these stories that I've read for you today, which one was your personal favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.